it's been barely 24 hours since our first class so um, obviously like we'll get a nice little break uh, this week but keep in mind that after next week we're actually going to be already one quarter of the way through the, the class lectures which is hard to believe right we'll have a lot of time in between certain classes like later in the semester so it's not exactly a quarter of the way through but we'll, we'll have finished a lot of material um, the picture you're looking at is a brain bow anybody know what that is it's taken by a neuroscientist named Katie Matho and it's basically a uh, this I think uh, I want to say it won the Nobel Prize. No, what's a famous prize in chemistry? Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's, a, it's a way of basically imaging neurons in the brain, and we're going to learn a little bit about artificial neurons later today. We're going to uh, introduce neural networks today. We're going to talk about how they work, and we're mostly going to focus on the forward pass. And what I mean by that will become clear when we actually introduce them. We're not going to talk about how they're trained today. I actually shuffled some things around a little bit, so we're going to do that next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about how training is done. And then we're going to introduce some practical materials, like our first practical materials of the course, which will be stuff in ML5, like, uh, like that's basically being developed by Chris over here, as well as Yiming and a team of collaborators. So it's very exciting to have like in-house uh, resources for this stuff. Um, and then I'll also show you some stuff from ML Frey. We're gonna do a few like practical things and, and then kind of assign some stuff over the, over the week. Um, I want to take care of some admin stuff first. So first of all, um, the first video, I literally just finished uploading it. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put the link on the syllabus later today, but it's online right now. So just be aware. I'm going to annotate it. <clears throat> so all the sections are done. Um, but so for anyone who missed this and wants to see the first lecture, um, that's uh, certainly welcome to you. It's going to be available. The next thing I want to talk about is the roster and auditing. Um, so we haven't had a lot of time to kind of clear this up. There's like 25 people in the room right now, which is which is like certainly okay by me. Um, there's like uh, I've I've talked to uh, George and Rob and, and kind of trying to figure out like uh, and Dano uh, about like how exactly to to work with this. There's a few people on the, the wait list that are still trying to get in, and I'm perfectly happy to extend the class. I've I've said that I would I would go up to like 20 or something like that. They um, sort of discourage me from doing so because you know like people, uh, we won't may, maybe that could become too large. I actually don't think it will be too large, and for uh, for the reason the reason being is because we don't really have like. A, like scarce materials to share, like we're not doing fabrication or anything like that. The only scarce material uh, is, is my attention. Um, however, compared to two years ago, uh, I'm actually a resident here. So I'll be here quite a lot. And so I'm actually pretty comfortable handling that. That being said, here's the, here's the, uh, the deal, let's say. So if, as I said last week, like if you feel like you're here just to watch and you have too much going on to really like be super active in the class this, this semester, then remember, you all of the all of the actual materials are going to be completely online. Um, so everyone, like within the class, outside of the class, and even outside of ITP, will have equal access to all of the all of the actual materials. So the the only reason to really take the class is for the credit, and and also like to you know make a make a kick-ass project, right? So if you feel like like um, you know you 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 think maybe. This is not a good time timing for you to do that. Then I would encourage you to drop the class. So then, then we have we can kind of manage it with a little less. However, I will uh, expand the class to twenty. And then for auditors, um, yeah, I mean I think it's it's totally okay by me. I mean it's pretty crowded in here. For the, for the auditors, I would say like maybe just make sure that registered students have like desk space, and that's that's basically all. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? We'll deal with the bureaucratic stuff after the class. It hasn't been long enough to kind of take care. Um, and uh, okay, office hours. So also haven't exactly specified this. I was looking at a tool called Calendly. Does anyone know this tool? I might maybe use this to schedule office hours, um, but I'm gonna email you about that like after today. Um, we will try to do like sort of light assignments uh, every class. So like, uh, and and I still haven't figured out exactly like how I'll you know how or if I'll grade them. They might just be kind of like recommended assignments, and then you know you can send them to me if you want feedback. But I'm I'm or or maybe maybe I'll again. It's like it's only been 24 hours, so I haven't figured it out. Um, uh, but we will do some sort of assignments. 
Um, I was thinking, so for projects, you know, we want to do a final project in the last week. And I was thinking, um, so just, just so you, uh, we, I showed the schedule earlier. Um, I'll show it again uh, in a little bit, but there's going to be, we're going to have like a two week break in the beginning of October. Uh, for one week is because, uh, so this is a 12 out of 14 week class. One of those weeks is I'm not going to, I'm going to be gone. So it's going to be not that week. And then the week after is, um, uh, is just Tuesday classes aren't scheduled at all. Uh, the week of October 9th, it's just like Tuesday is a Monday schedule or something like that. So we're going to have a two week break. And I was thinking to keep you occupied, uh, we might try to do like a sort of midterm project right on the other side of that. And that will kind of keep you um, busy while, you know, while, you know, because because a two week layoff is like, is, you know, that could be, well, it's really three weeks effectively, right? Because if we miss two weeks of class, it'll be three weeks between the classes. So that might be um, actually a good way to kind of keep everyone like on their toes. Yeah. And uh, another thing is uh, this, I mentioned this briefly yesterday, but uh, I've been kind of asking people around some, some of you I've talked to uh, about it, about having some sort of a lab section. And this would be like not a lab for this class specifically, but maybe something more informal um, that would be maybe associated with AI, but possibly broader. We're kind of figuring that out. I don't have any strong opinions on how it should work. I just kind of want to like do something that's a little bit more round table -y than, than me just kind of talking. And so that's something to just look out for. Apparently Friday seems to be a very good day to do this because most people don't have so many classes on Friday. And so it's kind of a good day to, to be loose. I, I would not think of the, the lab to be like a, a very technical section. It'd be maybe more presentation oriented or you know a place where people can come to get advice and projects, things, things of that sort. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of all um, for that. Any questions about admin stuff? Okay. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Yeah? Ah, uh, yes, um, good question. So that's actually here. Um, and yeah, just you can copy the link if you want. I'll, I'll also like send an email at some point. But this is over here. You can find uh, the syllabus. I have to update the syllabus because there's been some you know, minor changes in these first two weeks already. And I haven't put the, the YouTube link. I'll put that like right after. I literally just uploaded it just a second ago. So I'm going to put the link to that um, onto here and as well as the slides um, like sometime later today. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where you can find it. Make sure you capitalize the F. So no typos. Um, yeah, any others? Okay, so, all right, let's talk about, let's talk about some math. Okay, everyone have a look at the projection. I want you to memorize that. Okay, and we're going to, this is going to be actually, this is going to determine your grade. Um, we're going to have one minute to memorize all of those letters. And if you can maybe get 50% of them right after a minute, um, you'll pass the class. Otherwise, like, <laughs> so kind of difficult, right? Okay, well, let, let's try this again. How about this? Try to memorize this. Okay, so let's say I gave you one minute and you were, and I told you to, you will, you'll have to reconstruct this after one minute, right? How good of a job do you think you could do? Right. And, and I'm sure, you, you know, everyone's kind of looking at that and they see some some patterns, right? There seems to be some patterns that you might be able to kind of like abstract from the actual uh, like all of these letters and abstract some patterns that you can kind of memorize. And then when you go to type them down, you'll uh, you'll be able to extract them from memory. And you can see that there's a lot of regularity. There's a little bit of noise in there. Right. So some like W's and random letters and numbers that are sprinkled in like a little bit of noise but you can kind of see like a pretty there's a pretty obvious pattern there right so what is the point of this exercise it's to kind of try to define what we mean by features so you'll hear this word thrown thrown out a lot in the world of machine learning features right what do we mean when we say features so features are essentially patterns and they they can be a little people use them in different ways. They're not exactly necessarily a very well defined term, but, um, but my take on it is that they are patterns that are not explicit in the data. In other words, like this data, you know, the patterns are whatever you make of them, right? You, you might, 
you might see some patterns and there might be different ways of patterning this, right? Everyone, can, everyone might have slightly different abstractions that they use to memorize um, exactly what's going on here, um, but, but they're not explicitly encoded into the data, they're implicit, right? And uh, what we, another thing that we mean by features is that they, they are salient and in the sense that they kind of, um, well, salient is also not, <laughs> it's might as well, we might as well just say that salience is features as well. I mean, it's not exactly a very well-defined term either, but the idea is that they are useful for forming abstractions that can reconstruct the original data very well, right? And this is what our brains are doing all the time, right? So um, we're always forming these hierarchical uh, feature based abstractions of the world in order to to navigate it right um, this is actually very closely related to the idea of bias right so and we hear about bias a lot in machine learning and usually bias has the connotation of like being that biases are usually when we use the word biases we're referring to sort of almost like features that are harmful or uh, or unfair in some sense but they're just a subset of of uh, like a greater uh, a subset of the things that we do in order to basically survive, right? So like I'll give you an example. Um, when I walked in today, maybe I walked onto a hallway for the first time. And when I walked on the hallway, I trusted that when I stepped onto it, I would not fall to the center of the, of the earth, right? Because I've seen a lot of floors before, right? And they all seem to prevent me from falling to the center of the earth. And so, but I'd never seen that floor before. So I had no proof that when I stepped onto it, I would not fall to the center of the earth. However, I had made this assertion based on a lot of sort of built-in knowledge and sort of abstraction of features that identified this as a floor that would prevent me from falling. So this is kind of like, there's a very, very intricate interplay between features and biases that we are, that we're, that are very, is very, very worth being aware of, right? As we kind of like uh, learn about how these things work. Okay, so well, so that was just a little exercise, and and I'm going to come back to this idea of features when we introduce more uh, more clearly how neural networks work. So recall from from yesterday we talked about like the basic idea of supervised learning is that we're trying to fit some function which will map a variable x, you know, which might be a vector, and you know x can be a number, it can be a vector of numbers, it can be a matrix or a tensor of numbers, it can be an image, it can be a sound, it can be a string of text, it can be a set of uh, columns in an Excel spreadsheet that, that describes something, it can be basically anything, right? And we're map and, and f is a function which takes all of these x, x values and maps them onto some variable y. And y is, is essentially also just like x, it can be any of those other things, we usually think of them, uh, we usually think of just, you know, standard classification and regression, but Y can also be an image. It can be a sound, right? We talked about image to image examples and text to image and image to text, and there's just a lot of configurability. And it's very much worth understanding things in terms of the general picture because um, that will help you kind of appreciate just the, the, both the generality and the sort of like opportunity of, of bending these things in various ways, right? And not being constrained to certain uh, scenarios and uh, the way that we uh, figure out the, the way that we work with f is that you know initially we don't know what f should be but we desire for it to map x to y accurately and what we mean by accurately is in accordance with the training data so we have some training set which maps which has pairs of x and y and uh, we wish to model that relationship so that when we receive an unknown x it will be able to predict why uh, effectively, accurately. Um, so like more concretely, the way this generally works in supervised learning is we, you know, we'll have an image, let's say with images, like for something like image classification, we're gonna use a learning algorithm called gradient descent. And we are given a set of X, Y observations that we know, and we have to find the parameters, right? And we'll, we'll talk about what W is in just a moment we'll find the parameters which maximizes the accuracy of this, uh, of this particular supervised learning algorithm. And um, now we're not going to talk about gradient descent this week. We're going to talk about it in more detail next week. This week we can just treat it like a black box, right? We're going to say that gradient descent is, um, is basically like a, like, like a little magic box that will accurately give us X and Y. 
Um, that's how we can deal with it this week. And next week, we're going to try to actually learn a little bit more about how gradient descent works. And it's worth ver it's very much worth understanding it. Uh, a lot of people that work with machine learning at an, an applied level, uh, there's always a temptation to kind of just continue treating gradient descent like a black box. Uh, but it will actually help you understand very much if you if you know a little bit about and, and also it's just very much something that you might appreciate the beauty um, because it's it's improbable that it works like it still amazes me sometimes to think about it um, and well that's something that we'll kind of talk about next week this week we'll, we'll we're going to deal with things from just like working neural networks right um, okay so just a re little review a few of the uh, the categories that we're going to be dealing with today are going to be basically image classification, right? So you got a categorical, a set of categorical vari um, set of categories, and all of our images are one of those categories. And so we're trying to learn a mapping between image and our categorical variable. This is called classification. And regression is instead of categorical vari variables, you'll have one or more sliders you can think of it and i think that in the spirit of itp we can think of them as sliders right like a continuous value that you're trying to learn and these are um and, and in spite of the fact that they seem to be very different they're they're implemented almost entirely the same way which is kind of a nice feature of them and we'll see that uh, we'll see that later today um okay so let's like the the next the idea of the first half of today is going to be to try to build up from from something very simple to something that's like complex, right? Like a neural network, a convolutional neural network. That's going to be the goal for us to understand on, on some level how it works. Now, re remember, like, I just want to make a little disclaimer that people spend PhDs, like their entire PhD careers, trying to understand how these things work. And we're going to try to understand them in like the space of this, uh, of the first half of, t of this class, maybe the first three quarters, let's say. But, um, but, and we can actually like, I think the 2080 rule applies here. In other words, like, for let's say 20% of the effort, you can understand 80% of the uh, of the detail, and then you can spend a PhD learning the the rest of that 20%. But as a sort of first order approximation, we can actually learn how these work uh, with with relative like relatively well, um, and that's going to be kind of the goal. So let's start with something very simple, right? Like like just a linear regression, and and next week we're actually going to like um, solve a linear regression in order to try to make this a little bit more concrete. A linear regression is a line, right? So if you if x was just a single variable, a linear regression would say y equals w x plus b, or maybe uh, b uh, or maybe m x plus b. You know, depending on depending on where you're learning it. And um, what we observe is that given the data set of x y values, right, we um, we should be able to find. Uh, values for M and B or W and B that accurately uh, fit the uh, fit the relationship between our X's and Y's right uh, now this we won't be able to do so very well right because it's a line um, but but in in spirit like you that's that's the basic idea right you can try to define some sort of a line which captures the relationship between X and Y given a set of observations right and this is the kind of thing that you that you that you learn in like an introductory like a statistics course or 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 even like a like a, like you know basically like even in a high school statistics course right some some sort of a basically linear regression. Um, now we can model this with a sort of neuron diagram, right? Uh, this is kind. Of, let's imagine we have two variables x one and x two. So we can define a function that says that so so x capital X is the vector x one x two. And we can define this neuron to be modeling the following relationship. This is a little bit of a typo. I should probably have y equals, right? So this, this y is, is this, right? Just if that's not clear. Um, the relation, this neuron diagram models the following relationship. w1, x1 plus w2, x2 plus b. And um, it's, it's a plane, right? So if there was just one variable, then you would have a line. If there's two variables, it's a plane, and we can actually see that right here, right? So this is this is actually the the graph that of this function, right? So x1 and x2 are on on these on this axis, and then y is this axis, and it's simply a plane, right? And imagine we had a bunch of observations of 
you know, X1, X2, and Y, you know, they might, may or may not be on this plane, right? But we found a plane that roughly, uh, that roughly um, actually um, captures the points to some decent amount of accuracy. Um, now, it turns out, well, let's just look at this really quick. It turns out that this is not a very good way of fitting X and Y values because usually X and Y in the real world data sets is not very flat. It doesn't really occur along a plane. And so we have to kind of make a critical trade-off, which is that we introduce a non-linearity. The non-linearity is a trade-off because the good thing about it is that it will uh, be much more flexible. And you'll see why in, in a moment. It won't be clear just now. The bad thing is that they're, first of all, nonlinear functions are just harder to solve. There's no way to solve them analytically anymore. And that's kind of, that's going to be like the, the sort of, yeah, the, the, the trade off the machine learning starts with. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. So, I mean, in this case, you can think of like this maybe as like a two pixel image that we're trying to classify. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and, and pixels are, are your elements, yeah. right? Um, now, so the difference between this and this is that instead of going directly out, we're gonna take we're gonna take this and rela re we're gonna relabel it as z instead of y, and then we're gonna throw it through some nonlinearity, right? And this is basically a neuron, right? This is this is what neural networks are composed of. This is a single one, and uh, to start with, we're gonna we're just gonna uh, consider sigmoid function. Sigmoid function looks really complicated, like it's 1 over 1 plus e to the negative z, but it's actually expressing something relatively simple. What it does is it takes whatever unbounded value that you get, and it just kind of squashes it between 0 and 1 in a curved way. Right? Now, this may not seem like it accomplishes very much, but, the, uh, but for, for, rel for like mathy reasons that we're not going to really get into today, that will, uh, when we combine many neurons together, they are much more flexible in terms of being able to model the, uh, the relationships that, that, that we're going to have to observe in our data. So that's a sigmoid function. And, um, and yeah, that, and this is basically how it looks. And um, it's worth noting, by the way, that this neuron right here, uh, this, this whole thing, you can, it's, a, it's a little function, but it's also like a mini miniature neural network itself. Like one neuron can be considered a neural network. Um, is it possible maybe for us to close the window? The, the honking is like, is, is, yeah, thank you. I, if it gets too hot in here, we, we can open it up. But does it get hot in here after, after yeah. a while? It does tend to? Oh, yeah, is that okay? Uh, or will it be more noisy in the hallway? <laughs> okay. If it gets hot, we'll, 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 we'll reopen it. I'm sure it's not too big of a deal. Um, okay, so, okay, now, this is a simple diagram, right? Now let's complicate things a little bit. Uh, we're gonna add another layer, right? Now what's the difference between this and this? All of these units, they're just, they're the same as this, right? But now we're actually networking them together in layers. And the layers go from left to right. So here we have our X1 and X2 again, and there's our Y. But now we've put a, a middle hidden layer, as we call it, of three neurons in between this input layer and this output layer. And um, all of these connections, they all have their own Ws, right? And all of the neurons have their own Bs, their biases, right? And uh, so now we have one, two, three, six, nine weights. We have, we have nine uh, weights along the connections, and then we also have uh, four biases. So there are 13 parameters in this function. It's a 13 parameter function, right? With a bunch of sigmoid nonlinearities, right? Now this compared to this is more complex and the complexity uh, gives us a reward, which is that it's much more bendable. It can kind of capture a wider variety of possible functional shapes. Um, so let's actually do a quick demo. Um, I'm going to show you a demo that you can find at this link right here. You don't have to actually, you don't need to go into it because I'm, I'm just, it's just a, like I just can, I'm just going to show it on the, in my browser. But this is, if you want to, you could look at this later. So um, that's going to be right here. 
So imagine we have this neural network, and this one is a little is shaped a little differently. There's not two input neurons, there's three, and uh, so it's three by two by one, right? Now the goal is, let's say we're given a function, uh, sorry, we're given a data set that consists of one point. So there's just one point here, and this is the x values, and this is the y value, right? We desire to, uh, we desire to have a neural network such that when we input 0 0.1, 2.6, 2 2.8, we arrive with the, the y value is 0.43. That's our goal, right? And uh, of course, initially, we're not going to know how to do this because maybe we'll set all the weights randomly. So I mean, because we don't know any better, right? So why don't we set all the weights randomly? So here, we'll set the weights to be these, right? Over here on the first layer, they're just randomly set. Uh, I don't know if this is a little small, so I'll kind of zoom in. And uh, well, actually, I'll have to not randomly zoom in. Randomly set, but to still satisfy why? I'm sorry. It's randomly set, but it's still to satisfy why. It, uh, so yeah. you'll see in the minute. We're gonna try it, right? We we don't know if it satisfies why. We just we just selected a bunch of random ones, right? So let's give it a try. We input the the uh, the point, and it goes through these connections. And so like the first one is gonna be this, like the value, the input times the weight plus this input times the weight, plus this input times its weight, plus this bias. And then through a sigmoid nonlinearity, right? So this is a sigmoid function, and so it squashes it between zero and one, and the value we get is 0.75. Now the actual arithmetic is not that important, right? The important thing to consider is that the, the uh, relationship between these inputs and this right here is completely characterized by the parameters, the weights and the bias. Right? So depending on how those are set, we're going to get a different value for this. Likewise, we'll get a different value for this. And then onward, now we have, we have uh, 0.75 and 0.97 here. And we can go forward here. And then we arrive at 0.76. That's our final answer. Now, 0.76 is not correct. Uh, who I don't remember what, it, what the actual, it was 0.43. Right? 0.76 is not correct. Um, so, but, so how do we fix it, right? Um, just a quick aside, I want to mention some terminology here. Uh, these values, like inside of the network, inside of these neurons, right? The values that the neurons carry, uh, you'll often hear me or other people call them activations, right? So you might say like the neurons activation, it's activity. Um, they're kind of all used interchangeably. Activations it sounds very fancy, but it just means like the values of the neurons. That's it. Um, so, and that's, and sometimes people like, uh, when forming mental models, like it's very easy to conflate the weights and the, and the activations, they're separate, right? The weights are on the connections and the activations are in the neurons, right? And, um, and, and so forth. There's a multi multiplication between the two? Uh, what do you, between which two? Between the, uh, how do you get to the, the, the final on the right? So the final on the right is exactly as we do here, right? It's going to be this times this. So it's like, you know, y equals w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b through the sigmoid, right? Um, so this is incorrect, and right? We, this is and and how do we express how unhappy we are with it, right? Like what is how incorrect is it, right? Um, and for for today, this is actually not super important. It'll be it'll be more important tomorrow. But um, or sorry, next week. Uh, but one way of doing it is using something like mean squared error, right? Mean and or or in this case, just squared error, which is the difference between our desired value and our actual value, uh, our actual value squared. Um, the reason it's squared again has to has more to do with some calculus that we're not going to get into today. But um, but the point is like the bigger the distance between our our desired value and our our actual value the higher the mean squared error is. And our goal is to reduce mean squared error, hopefully to zero, right? So now how will we do that? Um, now, how we do that is going to be the subject of next week. So uh, we're not going to, so just for now, let's do it as a magic trick. I'm going to give you the correct weights. So here, I've actually given the, all of these weights are derived. So this set of weights, if you do the same process again, it will actually arrive at the correct value, right? So um, now again, just consider it a magic trick, 
we just did a magic trick, which is we found the correct weights and biases that give us uh, a mean squared error of zero, the exact right output. Yeah? So, uh, okay, so you, we just did a magic trick to figure out what the weights were. Yep. But where did the, um, where did the activations come from? The activations are calculated, right? So, so the, the value of this is, is, right? So let's go back to the slides, right? Right, like when you, one neuron is a function of the neurons that are input into it, right? So this one, this is, the, this is how you calculate it. So you, you take the weighted sum of the inputs that are feeding it, and then it goes through this sigmoid function. So then where do the B values come from? Which values? The B, the B values? They're, they're, they're just parameters that we have to find. Like the W's and the B's are all, all have to be found, right? So those are the givens? No, well, they're, uh, the givens is the data. So W and B we have to find. So like that's the whole point of training is to find, right? Um, yeah? So why are we put weights on the edges and B, which is like a weight on the node? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question. So like it's kind of like you can ask the question about a line, right? So if you have Y equals MX plus B, why do you need both an M and a B? Right. Well, so if you if you want to uh, be able to model any arbitrary line, then you have to have both like, you know, in linear in algebra, you would say like you need both the intercept and uh, y intercept and the slope. Right. So it's the same thing here. Now, there is a technical trick that that basically. So this this might help reduce a little bit of the confusion. There's a little trick that that we use in machine learning, which is that uh, the way that we implement this. Imagine that instead of x1, x2. We actually had a third variable, x3, which was always 1. So then you could think of, that, you could think of b as being just w3, uh, or being 1 times, um, uh, 1 times b, or 1 times w3. Like basically, the, the point I'm trying to make is that b and w are effectively the same. Like in, in term, for a machine learning scientist, they're all just parameters that have to be solved. Um, so, but that's a, that's a very technical trick. It's not, it's not important for our purposes. Just the point is that W's and B's are all these free parameters that have to be, that have to be tuned in order to get the relationship that we desire, right? Yeah? Are the numbers of the neurons, are they always random? The numbers are initially random, right? And then the point is that we have to find the, the uh, we have to find a set of values for the, the weights which accurately model the relationship between x and y? That's good questions. Any, any other? And how do you, how do you, how do you get y? Um, you mean this, right? Yeah. So you just, like we do a pass for each one, right? So first we go, we, we, we calculate this one right here, then we calculate this one right here, then we have this one, and then we do the same thing for, for this given these three. So the information all flows from left to right. Yeah, but the, the accurate one, like the one you want to... That's, that's, that's our data set, right? That's the thing that we're trying to model. That's given to us, okay. right? So, yeah? And then uh, for the weight for connections, is it um, like, uh, maybe this is a bad word, but like, is, are these, uh, do they need to like add up to a one, to one all together? No, or no, no. It could just be a totally abstract value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the output is always switched between zero and one. We're talking about that Y or uh, yeah, yeah, right. And, and actually, like, like again, these are little technicalities. Like, actually, you you wouldn't have a sigmoid at the on the end. I just for the sake of simplifying this, I wanted to make everything hom homogeneous. But the thing to abstract away from all of this is that you have a function that maps x one and x two to y, and that the shape of that function is entirely determined by the weights and the biases, right? And we, from now on, we can just say the parameters or the weights. Like if I say the weights, I mean the biases also. Um, just basically the parameters of that function, right? So if it were a line, the parameters are M and B. If it's a, um, you know, if it's a plane, it's W1, W2, and B, and so on. Um, and depending on how we set those weights, our function look will have a different shape. And we want to find the shape which minimizes the, the uh, the, the loss between our desired values, which is the ones in our data set, and the actual values that we get when we forward them through the network. 
Does that make sense? Roughly? It'll make sense upon repeated viewings. Um, and I'm going to give you reading materials for, for next week, uh, which, which might help to make this more concrete. For me, it always took like repeated, and from other people too. It's very useful to like get different explanations for this, um, but, but it will sink in. Yeah, um, That I can assure you. And if it doesn't sink in, like come see me and we'll talk about it some more. Because it, it sometimes like, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like, it, it'll, the, the, great, the great thing is that once you understand that, you understand 80% of machine learning because basically everything else is just like special cases of that that are just way bigger like the same thing except instead of three neurons there's going to be a hundred million right and that's that's really that's really the difference uh it's very homogenous though so it works the same way just on the massive scale so once you understand that that notion um it's very useful and i would encourage you to like look at this demo again and try to go through it and maybe maybe even maybe even do the calculations yourself and it will and it should start to make sense um, yeah. So, uh, if we didn't get the correct Y, we just try another group of W S M Ds. So we'll talk about how to find those weights next okay. week, right? So for now, like, assume that I've given you the correct weights, right? Um, the the way of of getting the weights is what's called training. So that's what training a neural network means. It's finding the weights, finding the parameters that give us the the function that we desire. And it's the central aim of machine learning research. So it's, it's kind of like, like the hardest thing about it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how it works, but for now, just like consider it a black box. There is some way of finding a set of weights, right? Like, and, and just, just to be like, just to maybe give a hint, like you can think of some naive ways of trying to do it, right? Just doing random, like doing a bunch of random guesses. You could do random guesses, right? It turns out that that's a horrible way of doing it because it will take you a hundred million years to solve even a network that has like like a hundred neurons, right? Because the number once you add more and more uh, values to the the space, like the it just explodes infinitely, and so you can't try all of the different combinations of numbers even with really fast computers. You have to find some way of doing it in a more efficient way, and that's going to be what we show next week. Um, yeah, you can look ahead. I've written about it over here in ML for A. So like, if you look at how neural networks are trained. I might assign that as reading. That might actually be a good idea. Um, but, but yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. So, so again, just to abstract, like we're trying to find, we're trying to uh, find the weights of this network such that when we map, or such that when we pass x1 and x2 through it, this is called a forward pass. Sometimes you'll say, when we when we forward x x1 x2 through it, we get the correct y. Now, it, now, usually our data will contain many points, right? And so it won't usually be possible to get a z uh, an error of zero for all of it, right? It's like when you fit a line through uh, like a set of points, you can't quite get all of the points. Um, or, well, technically you can, but it's for reasons that we'll explain next week. It's not necessarily a good idea. Um, but so it, there will be some loss, right? But we want to have a low loss. Uh, we want to have as low a loss as possible. Uh, the loss is some, for example, mean squared error, right? So that's the error between the actual values uh, and the uh, and the values predicted by our network. Okay. Now um, I want to uh, just a qu another quick uh, like change to this. So it turns out for uh, so sigmoids are kind of always a good way of starting because that's how neural networks used to be used. Uh, in practice, sigmoids are very rarely used now. Um, and the reasons for that are, are, are very technical. It has to do with something called a vanishing gradient problem. The basic idea is that, um, well, it's, it's not gonna make any sense. You can, look, you can look up vanishing gradient problem, but it turns out for like very mathematical reasons, sigmoids just don't work very well. And so starting, uh, I wanna say maybe 10 years ago, something like that, 10, 15 years ago, um, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the kind of like forefathers of, of deep learning, came up with this idea of a rectified linear unit. Sounds very complicated, but it's actually expressing something even simpler than a, than a sigmoid. Um, instead of using sigmoids, we use max of zero and z. In other words, like if the value of this of this is uh, more than zero, then let it pass unchanged. 
and if it is less than zero, just make it zero. So, uh, so basically it looks like this. It's just kind of got a hard stop over here at zero. Now this uh, is actually simpler, right? Like it just has a very simple shape and it turns out to work better. And there's like varieties of this, but, but that's, that's what's typically used. And when you hear ReLU, that's what this is. And most neural networks, especially deep neural networks, are using ReLUs now, uh, generally speaking, for most, for most of the operations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's look at a concrete example, right? Um, this is the hello world of machine learning, right? This is, this is the thing that like thousands of like, like entering machine learning students have looked at this data set. It's called MNIST. Um, this data set contains 60,000 images of, uh, uh, which are 28 by 28 grayscale pixels of handwritten digits, right? And the data set contains both the images and the labels. So we know that you know, in the data set, this is a zero, this is a two, nine, and so on. So this is an image classification problem. The goal here is to uh, be able to take in an image of a handwritten digit and output the correct label for that image. Right? Um, and, and if we do it correctly, then all of the applications, the applications should be, should be apparent, right? So then you could, for example, make an application that, that takes a picture of a digit, crops it, and turns it into a 28 by 28 image, and then can classify the correct number for you. So, for example, when you, when you put in your check into one of those autom automatic uh, machines, there's going to be some algorithm, most definitely it's a neural network, which will read those numbers for you and, uh, or, or for the bank and then, you know, deposit some money into your account. Obviously, it has to be very, very accurate, right? Like if it's not even, if it's anything less than 99.9% .9 accurate in the digits, you're going to have like thousands of irate customers um, and also thousands of very happy customers. So you have to do a very good job, right? Um, okay, so... Let's consider, um, let's consider this, right? So in, in image, what is it as a data, as data, right? It's just a bunch of pixels. That's all we have. So in this case, there's 784 pixels and those pixels are typically eight bit, right? So they're between zero and 255, right? And we can, we can usually like, we'll, nor, if it's very normal to, this is again like little details that are not super important to us, but normally we'll use we'll flatten them so they're between zero and one, like a float. Um, but but basically this is this is the the input, and so what can we do? Well, we can use this and input it into a neural network. We can actually have an input layer which has 784 inputs, and the pixels go directly into them, right? So there's a little ellipsis here, right? So there's actually way more of these. And then, you know, they'll go downstream into some neurons, right? So, for example, uh, like a full neural network, a, a really simple one might look like this, right? This is a one-layer neural network. There's no middle layer. We go directly pixels to 10 output neurons. Now, why are there 10 output neurons? Why isn't there just one, right? If there were just one, right, how do we interpret it? Like, like we're trying to, like, we want the... Like, it, let's suppose, like, we had one neuron and that neuron was supposed to be the digit, right? It w it, it, that might seem appealing, right? Because it makes sense, like, okay, we'll have zero and then maybe it'll be... And if, it, if, it, if the output neuron is zero, then it's a zero. If the output neuron is one, then it's one. That makes sense, right? But the thing is that the digits are not actually continuous. Like, we're not predicting a continuous value. We're predicting, like, a, a categorical variable, which is, like, is... It's, it's a, is this an image of a zero, an image of a one, an image of a two? So for classification, we actually will have 10 output neurons. And the idea is that whichever one has the highest value at the end is the one that we predict, right? So this has a set of weights. We would project all of these, uh, these uh, pixels through here. It gets multiplied by all of these weights and added together. And then it goes through some nonlinearity, and then we get a value at the end. And whichever one has the highest value, that's our that's it, that we predict. We predict that, right? Yeah. So we have as many output neurons as we label. Uh, uh, exactly. Yes. 
Uh, like, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Vari different categories for that variable, right? Um, that's for classification, right? So, um, so let's let's consider something really well. Here, let me let me let me think for a second if we should. Let me first show you the next slide, and then I'll come back to this in just a moment. Um, oh, actually, I don't have. Oh, I should have a. You know what? Let me quickly get out of this and show you. Let's go to here. And I want to. So it, yeah, so here is an example, right? This is what we get an image of a nine, and then all of these values will have a little bit of activity, right? You see that there's a little bit in seven and four and eight. The others are zero, or very close to zero. And then the nine neuron has a very high activity, and so we predict nine, right? So that's the way we would do classification with the neural network. So if we we get a two, predicts two. You notice that usually for for it usually has a very high confidence because this is an easy problem. Handwritten digits is a very easy problem. Sometimes you'll get an ambiguous one. So this is like a weird five. You know, and it and it you know it could almost pass for an eight to a machine, but it's reasonably good. Some we'll we'll get to a mistake at some point. Here, this one almost got to nine, right? There should be a mistake coming up. Let's see if we can find a mistake. Here's a mistake. The correct value is one. So in, it's green in the, because um, the label associated with this image is one, but the network actually predicted seven, right? And you can see why. Someone wrote down the one really weird. You know, so, um, Ah, why is there a middle layer, right? Well, uh, you're talking about why is there why is there this? Yeah. Right. Is it to make it more accurate? It's to give it more flexibility. So, and this is kind of the whole point of deep learning, which we'll we'll get into in just a moment. But going from from something like this to to this, you give it more levels at which it can capture uh, uh, features. And actually, like I have a slide just after this, which will show you the difference between one layer and two layers that might clear it up. Um, so let, let me punt that question for a second. Yeah? Um, so all of these, uh, I've seen, I mean, we've seen this example numerous times, and uh, it always seems like it's breaking it into um, a, a tiny little raster image. Is anyone um, doing that sort of, um, uh, I guess, recognition of the actual strokes and the line weights and the sure. um, vectorized approach to it? Yeah, I mean, if you have a vectorized image, right, it, that's, we don't have the tools yet to deal with that. But there are diff there are neural networks that because you can think of uh, like a vector image, a vector of strokes, right, is a sequence of points, right. So um, these neural networks that we look at cannot deal with sequences. So it has a fixed input, right. So if you have a any number of vertices in your in your in your input, that doesn't work, right. So this only deals with rasterized images. There are ways of dealing with um, with vectors, like like a sequence of points, uh, but we'll get to that probably later in the semester. And and if you want to look ahead, those are recurrent neural networks, all right? Or LSTMs, you might also uh, consider researching that. Um, okay, good questions. So uh, let's let's consider this, right? So let, okay, now going back to this, let's say we have this one layer network that has ten outputs for our classes. One thing that's very useful to do is uh, to actually try to visualize the weights because the, if we visualize the weights, they might actually give us some interesting insights, right? One way of doing that, right? So this this thing on the left is just a, a summary of this, right? You have seven hundred eighty four pixels. And you have 10 output classes. And let's, for, for a moment, consider just one of the output neurons, right? It has connections coming in from each individual pixel, right? So this has, has there's 784 pixels. And therefore, this, is a, this has these 784 pixels plugging into it through 784 connections. And each of those connections have weights, right? Is that clear? You can kind of see that here. Now, one useful thing for us to do is consider uh, you, another view of this, right, is something like this. This uh, uh, non-filled-in dot is called a Hadamard product. It's, it's a, 
um, point uh, basically uh, the formula is like element wise multiplication all added together so x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus x3 times w3 and so on right equals z right so that's what that means right and we can consider the weights as a square like we can because remember the original image is 28 by 28 pixels so in the network we unroll all the pixels right however the weights correspond to pixels in an actual like position of a square so let's consider the weights for the moment in the same configuration right so just so just so that's understood so when we look at this we're, we're actually visualizing all of the weights associated with each of these output neurons. So this right here is all of these weights. Zero is black. Uh, uh, z well, technically, um, technically black would just be the. It's normalized from lowest value to highest value. So zero. Uh, so black is the lowest, and then and then you know basically the brighter, the bigger the value. Um, and and I've gridded them into the same shape as the input images. So they're, they're actually 28 by 28 pixels, right? So initially, all of the weights are random, right? And when we, tr when we begin to train the network, the, the way the training works, I'll give you a hint, right? So, so because all I said before was it's a magic trick. Now I'm gonna add one more piece of information to it, which is that the, this magic trick that trains it is, is iterative. In other words, it works in steps. It changes the weights slightly, then reevaluates, changes the weights slightly, then reevaluates, changes the weights slightly, then reevaluates, and it keeps on doing this repeatedly until the accuracy climbs higher and higher and higher. Um, the reason why it does that will become clear next week when we, when we introduce gradient descent. Feel free to look it up ahead of time. But gradient descent is an iterative algorithm. It works like iteratively, right? You do it as like a loop continuously and so we can visualize this process if we visualize the process of training and we look at these weights watch what happens as we begin to feed it more and more examples the accuracy begins to go up and the the weights if we visualize them appear to have some sort of pattern to them can you tell what that pattern is right so this is the weight uh, these are the weights associated with the neuron that's classifying zeros these are the weights associated with the neuron that's classifying ones, twos, threes, and so on, right? Four, five, six, seven. So what do these look like? Right, they look like, they, exactly, right? They, they look like the numbers themselves, or they, they almost look like, I like to think of them like snow angels. They're kind of like the numbers made snow angels. Or you could say that they're almost like averages. You know, they're like averages of all the numbers. Um, in any case, it's, it's, they look like the numbers. They're forming almost like archety archetypes of the numbers. Now, why, why would they do this, right? Does anyone want to take a, a guess or want to give an explanation? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, we have a 28 by 28 images in grayscale. So if you visualize our weights as grayscale values, then they're going to appear similar to an archetype of numbers. Why, though? Why, why, would it want the, why would it want it to be similar? Well, you want to think of high probabilities of the input matching your, your model. So the, where it's going to be bright, it's like the middle stroke of the one, it's going to, you know, the archetype's going to be... The exactly, bright. yeah. Uh, does anyone have another... So the weight holds the bias. The, well, the weights in, in the... In this case, we're talking about numbers, so I don't agree that it's zero, looks like that, but if you're trying to recognize, I don't know, some one that looks like this, in a way, it holds like the bias, or you say, like, the eye has to be clear and whatever. Right. It, it, it's even simpler. It's like the weights, uh, you want to multiply the, the high pixels times high weights to get high value, right? So this, like let's, let's use, like forgive the anthropomorphization, the, this zero neuron wants to have a high value for a high activation when we receive images of zeros and it wants to have a low act, uh, value, low activation when it receives images of non-zeros. So the way it can best achieve that is by having high weights for pixels which line up where zeros tend to occur, right? Because you'll have pixels that get multiplied by these high values and that contributes to the activation going high. And also it keeps the middle dark. And the reason why it keeps the middle dark is because other numbers 
have tend to have pixels on here and the zero doesn't and so therefore it wants to deweight them so that it doesn't have a high activation when other numbers come through so it's kind of just like we want to like and, and again so just to abstract we want to match the pattern like it's looking for things that look like this so it's a pattern matching scheme and it's the pattern that it's trying to find is the is the zeros themselves and yeah so does that mean um, the where the uh, numbers are situated in that square is important and if for instance if the square were larger than 28 by 28 you got some in the bottom right and some in the top left it would be difficult to identify well the, the the square must be 28 by 28 because the network is fixed size so it always receives an image that is that is 28 by 28. Now it is the case that maybe the zero will be a little bit on the top left or or, or it'll be on the top bottom right, right? And so it has to account for that. And so in now in the one layer neural network, it can, the best it can do is just kind of trying to average. You know, it kind of hedges its bets. That's why it's kind of blurry. It's like, oh, zeros tend to occur around this area. And so it'll try to get the most the most value that it can, you'll see why this is, this accuracy is very low for a handwritten digit recognition. And the reason is because it can't really do a very good job in one layer. And you'll see in just a moment, like how we can deal with that. Um, any, any others? Mm -hmm. So the whites are the features, the extreme whites and extreme blacks are, are the features that we're looking for? We, we, uh, the weights are the weights and then features you could say are, are um, patterns that are encoded uh, in uh, by the weights you know so like you could say that there's a feature that looks like you know zeros loops you know or or loops or strokes uh, yeah sure you could say that's a feature yeah or a loop right or a stroke these are features they're not explicit right there's nowhere it says that it's kind of like we look at it and we can see the features mm -hmm. yeah What do you, can you clarify it's your question? It's the training that we're talking about next. How they're discovered? So we'll talk about how they're discovered. Like, the point is that this is what happens when they are discovered. Yeah? Uh, you don't need to, like, train those numbers separately. You can just include them all together. I mean... You, you must train them all at the same time. Like, there's, um, there's no way to train a neural network sort of, like, class by class. But if you yeah. train you you can train sample by sample, uh, but but again, these are more relevant to next week. But but they're usually trained in multiple samples. Like we'll kind of, you'll, you'll we'll we'll talk about it. But basically, we're feeding in samples. Yeah. And what if mm -hmm. we had like I don't know forty percent more threes, then the training will not be accurate. Or what What do you mean? If we have more three features in the data set. If we have more threes in the data set. Yeah then it will probably be biased a little bit towards predicting threes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, this is the whole idea of features. I'm just summarizing the, the last slide. Um, now, okay, th that's what we had with one layer, right? Now, it turns out, though, that, that it's kind of insufficient, right? And the reason is because, you know, imagine for something like numbers, we have people have all sorts of different handwriting styles, right? Like suppose, for example, you consider sevens, you know, how many people when they handwrite a seven, they put a little middle, like to distinguish it from a one, they write a little dash through it, right? I do that. Does anyone else? And who doesn't do that? Look at that. So, okay, like at least a quarter or a third of people do that. And then two thirds of people don't. So how would this poor digit, you know, how would this poor filter deal with that? Would it have like half, you know, and you can kind of see what it's doing. It like, it's like a half turned on maybe, <laughs> right? It would be better if we can maybe think of like, there's multiple kinds of sevens. Maybe we might be able to more flexibly capture that. And the way that you could do that is by having multiple layers, right? So, so let me show you how that would work. So suppose we had a network that looks like this. Now there are 10 middle neurons, there, there could be 15, there could be 20, there could be 100, 
there, it, it, the point is that we just have a middle layer. Um, the question that invariably arises is, why, how do you pick what number it has, right? We can't really pick the input and the output. That has to match the, the data set, right? So there's 10 classes, so there has to be 10 output neurons. There's 784 pixels, so there has to be that many inputs. How do you decide how many neurons are in the middle? And um, now the, the answer to that is it's basically arbitrary, like a scientist figures it out, whatever works well. Um, but so just don't worry about that. The po in this example, there happens to be 10. It doesn't have to be equal to the output. It, it could be any number, right? Um, but in any case, like let's say we have middle, something in, uh, we have a middle layer. So then how would that look, right? Well, um, we can still do this process of visualizing the weights in this layer, right? Because there's going to be 784 weights plugging into each of these, right? Uh, but now in, in, in the output neurons, there's only 10 weights uh, uh, going into each one, right? So the way that we, we can actually visualize this in the following way. Let me explain what we are looking at. These things right here are these, these 10, uh, like when I say filter, I, uh, that's also like, um, it's like the set of weights. So that's another terminology you'll, you'll hear. It's like, this is a set of weights that we that going into this neuron that we'll, we can call a filter right and it's a filter because it's kind of like it's almost like a stamp you know it's like you stamp the input image into that pattern and then however much ink it collects is like the value of that neuron something something like that i think is a decent analogy or that's the way i think of it sometimes but in any case like the visualization of each of these is here now it doesn't look like the actual numbers anymore and we, we can kind of explain them in just a moment, but um, just let me explain these rows. Now these rows are corresponding to each of these output neurons. And so like you can think of this output neuron as a sum, a, like a weighted sum of each of the activities of these neurons, right? And so for example, the zero neuron, let's, what would it, how would it deal with this, right? Well, the zero neuron wants to classify zeros, right? So it might attach a high weight to filters that look that 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 are roughly um, sympathetic to zeros, let's say. And you can kind of see, like, okay, filter two has this sort of, you know, like a little bit of a loopy thing going on here. Filter four has a loopy thing. You know, filter seven and eight they're kind of roundish, right? And then something like filter nine has a lot of. Uh, a lot of activity in the middle, and so it downweights it, right? So it's kind of like combining these different patterns into uh, a, like a, a sum, you know, weighted sum of these patterns that gives us the final value for zero. So I, I know this is a little abstract, but but the 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 way the takeaway you can take from this is that instead of trying to just learn a zero like in one filter we can try to combine small patterns together into like a zero, right? And when we, when we introduce convolutional networks, we're gonna take this to the next level. But in, in this case, we can, we can do that as well. And so, okay, just contrasting the one, the one is almost the opposite of the zero, right? It, it likes things that have values in the middle because ones are tend, to, tend to have you know, a stroke through the middle. Um, now this lets us find multiple, it kind of lets us find multiple ways of combining um, uh, m multiple kinds of digits, right? We have a little bit more flexibility in this case. And this is kind of the reason why there are multiple layers, right? If you're wondering why deep learning is called deep, deep basically means many layers, multiple layers. That was kind of the core realization that, or, or the core success of deep learning was that if we have many layers, we can learn almost like a hierarchy of features. And we're, we're gonna see this in the, in the probably, probably after the break. Like we won't take a break just now, but when we introduce convolutional networks, we're gonna see why this works so well. Um, yeah? Just a question about the number of um, nodes in the middle layer. Is there a, a minimum, like would having less than 10 nodes in the middle layer be, be like throttling information or would it still make more complex than the version without um, it's actually it's actually a good question because 
it, there's two in some sense it's uh, it throttles it to some degree because because yeah there's less there's less values coming out of here um, so yeah I mean it probably does but but it also it is more complex information so than than the original pixels so there's kind of a trade-off there so it, in theory you get more you will definitely get more accuracy with, you should get more accuracy or at least the same accuracy. Because right. the number of weights that we introduced. There's more weights, yeah. right? More weights means more flexibility, right. but that comes at a cost uh, and we'll, we'll get into that next week. So there's, there are mass, there are trade-offs there. It, it would be very rare to see, for example, less than 10, less than the output neurons in the middle layer. That's very uncommon. Like I, I don't really see that. The, except for one, a special thing which we introduced briefly yesterday which is auto encoders but that's for a separate reason we'll get into that later um yeah was there um so you mentioned this idea of like um you know uh different different letter forms of seven um and uh, would there ever be a, a reason why you might want to say instead of having categories being into 10 different out, um, categories maybe adding an 11th one being like oh and this is the second with a really weird squiggly in the middle the uh well i mean and then, you then say that those and then merge those two categories at, at a later you point. could do that there's no reason why you couldn't but that's really uncommon because like the whole point of machine learning is to automate this stuff rather than us making a whole bunch of rules like that um, and so like typically these things are better than us at doing at combining right um, I mean once you do that you could say well, why not like have you know five for each one right uh, b before you know it, you're not doing machine learning anymore. You're just doing like, like rules, and that's 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 the contrast between machine learning and, and rule-based systems like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let's just see how we're doing. Time one twenty. We can say uh, we started. Okay. Let's. Oh, so we're still. We'll take a break like one and a half hours in. So let's go another fifteen minutes or so, and I'll take a break. Um, okay, CIFAR 10. This is another data set that um, is more complex than numbers. We've been dealing with a pretty simple data set. When, why, why are numbers simp more simple than these, right? So first of all, what is CIFAR? This is a data set with 10 categories, like, like MNIST that has 10 categories, but the categories rather than numbers are, uh, let's see if I can remember all of them, automobiles, um, so, so like cars, trucks, uh, do uh, wait, dogs? Yeah, dogs, cats, frogs, uh, ships, uh, horses. Um, I forget what else is in there. Um, birds, yeah, birds, airplanes. So basically, the, those are the categories. Something like that. Yeah, deer. Deer has deer. Um, no, wait, does it have deer? I don't. I don't remember. The point is that it has like those ten categories. And um, so, why is this? First of all, why is this more complicated? Is it? Is that you know something that I decided? Well, it's it's more complicated for a couple of reasons. The, the most obvious reason is that it's in color, right? So if it's in color, that means that we have three times as, mu as many numbers, right? And uh, the way that we deal with color is, is, is we simply just have three times as many neurons. You know, everything is unrolled into a single vector. So we have one pixel RGB, two pixel RGB, three pixel RGB, and so on. So that, 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 that won't complicate things. However, it is more data, so our network is bigger. Um, now, why else is it more complicated, right? Well, color introduces complexity because the objects can come in different colors, right? Um, there's other things too. So like consider these cats, right? These are all a bunch of pictures of cats, extremely rare, very rare find. And the cats have, you know, like, like observe all the diversity in these pictures. The cats are, some of them are curled up, some of them are outstretched, um, some of them are like, you know, looking in different directions. Um, the, the images themselves have backgrounds, right? They're, they're cluttered with other objects, right? So in general, there's a lot more diversity in image of, images of cats than there are in images of fives, right? You wouldn't draw a five upside down or, or backwards, right? So this, may, this means that if we try to do this approach with one layer, let's say, just to start with, if we try to do this for CIFAR 10, the filters would end up looking like this, just total mush, right? And I can tell you that it would be very not accurate. Like it would, you know, it would be like, okay, if you took random guesses, 
you'd have an accuracy of 10%. If you applied a one layer neural network to this, you'd have an accuracy of like, let's say, um, like, I don't remember what it is, but like 25 to 30%, right? So better than random guesses, but not very good, right? Um, so, so what do we do about this, right? Well, okay, we can add more layers to the network. That helps a lot, right? But there's going to be some, some diminishing return here, right? Because for, for reasons that we won't explain it at, most rigorous, at the most rigorous level of detail, but the point is we can do better, right? We can, and we've known about neural networks in their current form for a long time. Why didn't they work so well up until recently? And um, that gets into <clears throat> the, the reason is because of these, right? So convolutional neural networks, right? So people have probably heard this term thrown around, convolutional neural networks, right? They're kind of, they were a big buzzword a couple of years ago when we started to, when we started to use them for image processing. Um, convolutional neural networks have been around for actually a long time, but they have only become very successful recently. And, and I'll talk about the reasons why that's true um, in just a little bit, but let me first introduce them uh, like more broadly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how these are distinguished from what we've seen so far. Um, before I do that, let me, let me try to build up some, some intuition about what, there, what limitations we have in the previous model that convolutional networks are trying to, trying to solve. Right? And first, let me just give you a little bit of history about them. So uh, convolutional networks have been, um, you, you could say that they, they're the, the, um, they go back to, let's say, the 1980s, but you could say that the research that kind of influenced them uh, goes back to even, even further, to the 50s and 60s. So uh, maybe some people might be familiar with uh, the, the, um, the neuroscientists Hubble and Weasel, right? They did these like pioneering experiments in the 1960s where they tried to like learn all sorts of characteristics about uh, the visual cortices and of, of mammals, right? Um, and they did these experiments, are these poor kitties, very sorry to, um, well, to show you, but basically the, what they did was they placed the electrode in these cats' brains and they measured their, uh, they measured the responses as those cats were exposed to like patterns on a little TV screen. Uh, now I'm, we're not, this isn't a neuroscientist, neuroscience class and I don't know anything about neuroscience, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to say much more than that, but I'll just say what they discovered was that the uh, visual cortices of cats and, and likewise humans have um, this sort of hierarchical approach to uh, organizing the, the, concept, the conceptions of objects, right? Features, we could say. So it, the, the neurons that are directly connected to the retinas of these cats' brains, the, 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 the neurons that are most closely connected to the retinas, they basically respond to like uh, really simple uh, edges, edges, like lines, like basically they would have uh, like a line in the TV and depending on how they rotated it, the different neurons connected to the retinas would light up, right? That's probably a very simplified explanation of what's going on. I'm sure if you're interested, you could read, you could read uh, their papers or what, what, what it was written about them, but something along those lines, like the retinas respond to simple uh, stimuli. And then what happens is that those neurons get combined into other neurons, like farther down, downstream, they combine those edges, right? And then they combine them into somewhat more complicated shapes. You know, maybe you have edges and if the edges are connected like in the right angle, you might have a neuron that kind of detects right angles, right? Or you might have a neuron that detects crosses or a neuron that detects parallel lines, right? And then those neurons connect to another set of neurons, which, uh, d which are able to find even more complex patterns, right? So maybe corners or, or, or crossing lines can be combined to grids or lattices, right? And then those neurons get combined farther down into even more complicated patterns, right? And, and so on. And it kind of goes through this hierarchical uh, layer by layer approach where the things that are detected are continuously becoming more and more complicated or high level. So at some point they're detecting entire objects, you know, um, objects that might be relevant to a cat, you know, mouse, for example. Um, yeah? So how does this idea of like a feature hierarchy differ from like the, from like a neural network with multiple hidden layers that we were just talking about? 
It, it doesn't uh, like a neural network with multiple hidden layers is essentially doing that. So, so uh, it's not. Uh, I, I should say, in the case of what's confusing, it's not like convolutional neural networks are uniquely responding to that. This has been known for a long time, uh, but convolutional neural networks will actually take this to like the next level. Let's say, uh, but but yes, it's a good observation. So, like it it does detect um, a hierarchy of patterns, even if you have those those layers the way that that we had them. Um, okay, so um, now the first convolutional ne neural network. This is actually a very contentious issue. Uh, so, like, if you ever want to, if you ever want to, um, like, see a good like, like, uh, machine learning scientist fight, uh, you can find like, you can find a lot of like. There's a lot of arguments over over just this this idea. Um, y y Jürgen Schmidhuber, who's a very famous like. Um, Who's a very famous machine learning scientist, inventor of LSTMs, which we'll which we'll introduce later in the semester, um, wrote this like um, Google Plus. Uh, it was a Google Plus post about uh, basically criticizing like the the pioneers of deep learning for kind of like ignoring the past or or like misportraying them misportraying themselves as like inventing stuff that had been invented like before. So it's kind of one of these things. We're not. It's 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 interesting, but it's not. We're not going to look at it. In any case, like um, I think there's some consensus that like that this um, this uh, something called a neocognitron, which was like uh, this paper written by a, a Japanese, I think uh, I'm not sure if he was a computer scientist or, or maybe like electrical engineer or something like that. Um, Kunihiko Fukushima in 1980 or maybe 1979 or something like that wrote this uh, neocognitron, a self-organizing neural network model for a mechanism of pattern recognition unaffected by shift in position. So the idea was to do um, to basically uh, make a neural network which in which the neurons were organized in a somewhat more complicated manner um, than the ones that we just saw, and the way that they would work was and actually is a, is a little more apparent like if we look at this right, it has small pattern detectors. Let's say like a little. So here this is the gist of convolutional networks. Uh, instead of having the, the the like weights be associated along the entire length of the image, we instead have like small filters, right? And those small filters kind of get scanned across the entire image onto every position, right? And, uh, and it's and the operation that it does is called convolution. Now, convolution is actually a very standard mathematical operation. So you might be familiar with like convolution reverb, like if you're into audio, right? And convolution is just a fancy way of saying like multiplying ve vectors along in, in a way that they're like kind of sliding across each other. It's like mixing signals with each other. It's uh, you'll see when we introduce the actual operation what that is, but it's actually a very standard operation that exists in many fields, right? And so what we do is this pa this is a f it's looking for a particular pattern along every part of the image, and then it results in these what we call activation maps, right? And the activation maps are just like the activations we saw, except they're kind of arranged spatially, where, where it shows how much of that pattern exists in the image. And then what happens is that they get combined into, uh, they, they, this is done multiple times, basically. And uh, at each stage, the activations from the previous layer are, uh, are convolved with new filters that attempt to capture more high-level patterns and then this is done multiple times, and then and then finally, it results in something. We're going to look at a specific architecture. So if this is this might be a little abstract, but we'll look at a specific architecture in just a moment. But this ends up working kind of better. So and and here's and here's another intu intuitive way of thinking about this, right? Suppose you're trying to form a mental model of cars, right? Um, one way of doing it, if if you were to do it using using this approach, you know, like one of these, or or even better, one of these, you would have to have basically like a filter for red Toyota, red 1982 Toyota, um, you know, blue 1990 Mitsubishi or whatever, right? Like you'd have to have like a like a filter accounting for all of these different kinds of cars, right? Now that's not the way that we actually envision cars, right? In your mind, the way you think of cars is, oh, a car is something that has wheels, and it has and it has uh, windshields, and it has, you know, doors, and it has all of these small objects. 
And then doors, well, what's a door? Well, a door is one of these objects that has kind of like a handle and it has a little glass, right? And it's kind of hierarchy, a hierarchy of components. And this makes it a lot easier and a lot more efficient, right? To form a mental model of these cars. You might, ima you might imagine that you have a filter telling you about the color and the filter telling you about the door and a filter telling you about all of these other features that then get combined. And so you kind of compactify your conception of cars into object categories, right? Or objects that combine. So that's kind of the intuition. And you'll see why in a moment why convolutional network capture this so well. Um, and, and yeah, we're gonna, we'll actually show a demo of them in just a moment also. Um, so, so just getting back to Neo Neocognitron, the reason why this is like, like when this was uh, conceptualized in 1980, it's a long time ago, right? Almost 40 years ago. But the thing is, at the time, there, uh, we didn't really know how to train them. So in other words, like uh, Fukushima basically encoded the weights manually. So he put in all the weights. Like he's like, okay, I want to detect the thing that will detect. Uh, I want to make a network that will detect letters or something like that. I think it was letters. And so he encoded all the weights himself because there was no way to learn them. Um, no, or, or because no one had figured out a way to do gradient descent effect essentially on on um, on uh, neural networks of this sort and that was kind of come up uh, the person who came up with that more or less was uh, Jeffrey Hinton who um, is very is you know con one of these considered one of the forefathers of deep learning kind of guy he's uh, he he, he uh, retired re like relatively recently he was like he was a professor at um, at University of Toronto for a long time. He's from England originally, and he was at Google for a little while. Um, anyway, like um, he kind of came. He basically figured out how to do what's called backpropagation, which is a computational uh, a computational algorithm for doing gradient descent uh, efficiently. And we're going to introduce gradient descent next week. Um, and so all of these terms will be. Don't worry about them. We'll we'll make them clear next week. Um, but anyway, so like, but at this time they couldn't do it. So this kind of was like lost for a little while. Um, after Jeffrey Hinton figured out how to do uh, how to do gradient descent on them, um, one of his uh, like I think uh, a postdoc that worked with him, uh, whose name is Jan LeCun, who you may know uh, you may know this name because he's the head of AI research at Facebook now. So like basically everyone associated with Jeffrey Hinton is now like a famous computer scientist. So. <laughs> Um, that's what happens when you, when you, um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that next, tomorrow, uh, next week. Um, anyway, uh, so let's, let's talk about how this works, right? Um, uh, actually, let's just see. So it's 1.35. Why don't we take a break and then we'll come back and introduce convolution. I know this is a lot of information. It's gonna, things are going to get more fun next, uh, like, well, like second half of next week, let's say. <laughs> so... As usual, I'm a bit late on <laughs> getting through the theoretical part of the material, but we're getting pretty close to the end. So hopefully, we'll kind of cap off convolutional networks, and then and then we have a you know baseline understanding of how neural networks work. And then what we're gonna do with most of hopefully like at least a good half hour is to actually start doing some basic practical stuff, um, which will involve those uh, th those demos. So hopefully, everyone's uh, the link that I provided earlier. Please do download those. Um, okay, so convolution. How does this work? So how do? So first of all, it's worth just in terminology. It's worth noting that convolutional neural networks are not like a separate category of neural networks. They're you know comparable to the, they're, they're they're just a special case of the neural networks that we've seen so far that have two basically two new types of layers which we're going to introduce. And the hardest one to understand is convolutional layers. So the way that convolutional layers work is very similar really to the way that the um, that the way that those the other layers that we've seen work so far um, but with a slight twist so and also just the terminal terminology thing the layers that we've seen so far they're they're called fully connected layers so when you see that all of the neurons in one layer are connected to all of the neurons in the next layer they're fully connected there are no empty connections right in a, in a, in, a um, in a convolutional network, what we'll have is we'll have a set of weights which are which is arranged in kind of a square, you know, usually a square, 
and you know maybe it has maybe it's like three by three or five by five that's very typical um, maybe seven by seven something like that and what we do is we take this five by five filter and we scan it across the entire uh, space of the image and we get a response that looks like this I'm gonna actually show you a demo that is online that you can see in the convolution demo right here so that's that's available in L4A. So basically, you have let's say a pattern, a filter that looks like this, and these are weights. These are just the same as all the weights we've seen before, right? We're visualizing them slightly differently, but it's a set of weights. But the weights are no longer the entire size of the image. It's a very small size of the image. And what we do is we actually scan those weights across the entire image, and we do the same operation. Uh, Hadamard product, element-wise multiplication and addition, dot product, right? It's just a dot product. So basically it's like the this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, and so on, across every spatial position. And so you can kind of, I don't know, it's a little faint to see, but there's a little red red square on the, on the right, on the activation map. That shows like the result of, at this point, this multiplying this pattern times this, uh, Sorry, multiplying this subregion of the image times that filter, right? And uh, and so this this whole process is called convolution, right? We're kind of scanning the image, and notice that whenever, like, and actually it'll be a little. Let's let's look at one of the different filters. Let's look at this one right here. So notice that whenever we're in a part of the image where the bright parts kind of line up, right? They line up more than they line up in other parts then you get a high activation right on the other side it's relatively bright whereas here where they don't line up so well it's kind of dark right and actually maybe this will be more apparent with one of the others all of these filters are kind of nondescript but um, but yeah you can you can kind of see okay so like here it'll it's relatively lines up so it's kind of bright it's a little i know it's a little hard to see but but there's a little red dot there or, or a little bright dot there now, in any case, like the, the best way to think of this is that this is like a pattern that we're trying to find in the image. And wherever, if the, if the subregion of the image perfectly matched the pattern, it would have a high, the highest value, right? And it would have a high value because it's a dot product. So dot products are always higher when you have big numbers times big numbers um, and comparatively small numbers times small numbers, right? Yeah? That's all like, like, I mean, there's, that's a loaded question. Um, that's like one of the, uh, generally speaking, this is like a, a lot of just like uh, trial and error. That's what scientists n normally do. We won't be doing so much of this kind of stuff, but generally speaking, it's like a lot of trial and error. There are approaches to trying to automate it. Uh, you can read about this, like uh, Google has an initiative called AutoML, which kind of tries to wrap it into the training process itself. But generally speaking, it's just a lot of like, trial and error. It's a very, very engineering oriented field, like, like almost not scientific. Mathematicians hate it, right? Because there's no way to prove like why one thing works better than another. Yeah? I'm a little confused about the two um, input nodes to that, um, I guess, neuron. Uh, so the bottom input node is the filter and the top one is... The yeah, the top one is just like, uh, we're just viewing, you see it's, you see when I move the green, it's just zooming in. It's like this of part like of. Data, right? So, so in truth, if that's five by five, there's twenty-five input nodes, and then the, the bottom filter becomes the twenty-five weights. There's twenty-five weights, yeah, and, there, and then it's 25, 25 pixels times twenty-five weights. Okay. Mm -hmm. Across every spatial position of the image, right? So then we get this response, right? And so we can try this with another sample, like here's a zero. So again, like maybe, maybe we can see like. Okay, this one has mostly, the pattern is kind of bright on the bottom left, right? So if we kind of put it over here, we have a roughly sympathetic thing. So it's relatively kind of bright right there. Most bright right there. And you can kind of see in the activation map where the red, where the red square is highlighted, it's relatively bright there. So basically wherever the pattern is found, it'll have a high activation, right? So that's, that's kind of what these things are showing us. They're showing us the amount of that pattern in every part of the image. And in one layer, we'll have multiple we'll have multiple convolutional filters, right? So here, there just happens to be a few of them. 
right? So we'll get multiple activation maps, okay? So just, just keep that in mind. And then I'm gonna actually do a full demo in just a, a moment. Um, so, uh, okay, so th that's convolutional layers. There's one more type of layer to know about, which is called a pooling layer. And that's actually much easier to understand. Pooling layers have no parameters, no weights. They, they just downsample the image by uh, normally by doing what's called max pooling, which means that like, let's say you have a four by four image, it will just take all of these, uh, like it'll group them into groups of two by two, and then it'll just take the maximum value, right? So from one, one, five, six, we get six. From two, four, seven, eight, we get eight, right? It's just a cheap way of doing downsampling. It's cheap because there's no parameters. Uh, it's just taking the maximum of every four values and condensing it into one, right? Now, the reason why pooling is done is because we're in neural networks, we're always trying to compact the information. We're trying to go from a lot of information, like a lot of meaningless information, like pixels, into high level meaningful information, which is less, you know, more compact. And pooling happens to be a cheap way of doing that. Pooling is actually gen uh, like, like slowly becoming obsolete. So like maybe in a few years, you won't see them at all because they don't really have any theoretical basis. They're just, they're just kind of like, again, it's a very engineering oriented field, like where we just find something that works and then, hey, why not? Um, that's why I said like mathematicians like despise deep learning because it's kind of like brute force, brute force computation, like combined with try everything and do whatever works. And like the theory very much lags behind. So that's kind of a funny thing about deep learning. Yeah? Why is it taking the maximum number and not doing an average or something like that? There's also average pooling. And, and uh, so you could do that. Uh, for whatever reason, like max pooling seems to, seems to work better. Um, but there's, there's very little theoretical justification for it, uh, um, strangely enough. Um, so, okay, so let me show you a full end-to-end -end demo of a convolutional network. And um, we're actually going to, we're probably, uh, probably next, I think next week we'll download these open frameworks modules. So far, is it still the case that everyone here is on Mac? Are there any people not on Mac? Okay, like I said, that'll actually make things a little easier because this application that I'm gonna show you will work on, we should work on basically everyone's computer. Um, and I'll show you the download link later. But for now, I'm just gonna show it to you as a demonstration. So this is CovNet Viewer. It's part of the open frameworks collection. And I'm going to open it real quick. Uh, it's actually over here. And this is going to show an end-to-end -end demo of a trained convolutional neural... Oh, hang on a second. Okay. Okay, so check this out. This is a trained convolutional neural network. You can download it from online. Um, I forget. It's, it's a particular neural network architecture that was very good in 2014 or something like that. Um, and it won the ImageNet challenge, which I'll actually mention later. And basically, uh, so this is a trained neural network. And this network was trained on millions of images from a data set called ImageNet, which is a very famous data set that has been used as a standard, as a standard benchmark for uh, a lot of image classification research for a long time. Um, or not that long, but about a decade, let's say. And um, so this is already trained, right? So let's, like, let's, this is trained to do image classification. It has 1,000 categories of images, 1,000 classes, right? Um, now, so like, let's say in the first layer, there's a bunch of convolutional filters and they look like this, right? There are a bunch of these color filters. And so at every spatial part of this image that's going in through the webcam, it's trying to detect each of these patterns, right? So, um, you know, and, and you can see they're very simple. Now, again, like you're thinking, why these patterns, right? And um, the, uh, first of all, they're, they're discovered, they're trained. We learn them. Init they're all weights, right? So remember, just to, because we're looking at, we're, we've been visualizing the weights in a variety of ways. And so it's important to maintain consistency. Like these are all the same thing. Like sometimes we view them as lines, as connections. Other times we want to visualize what the magnitude of it is, so we place them into these kind of visualizations. But they're all weights, right? And so these weights are looking for these patterns in the image, and there's 96 of them. There happens to be 96. Again, it's arbitrary, but it's just, you know, a bunch of computer scientists figured it out. And so then we have these results from it. And so you can kind of see, like, okay, 
some of the edges, they're kind of, they're some of the filter, uh, the activations, right? Some of the activation maps are kind of understandable. You know, maybe they're looking for vertical edges, right? Or horizontal edges, right? Or diagonal edges, right? They, they look very similar, but like, okay, this one, for example, you can kind of tell it's looking for horizontal edges. And maybe this right here is looking for, like, it seems to be responding for like bright white, you know, just like bright color, more or less. Okay, and then there's 96 of them because there's 96 of these filters, right? So, um, and then what happens is we take all of those and there's a normalization thing that happens. We're not going to talk so much about normalization. It just brightens it basically. And then it also pools it. So then we do the max pooling. So these become lower resolution. We do max pooling. So this compared to this has one fourth as many pixels. I'm, I'm just stretching them. So they're all the same size, but it has one fourth as many, uh, as many activations. Okay. Now here is going to be the most confusing thing in this entire course, I think. Um, and, and this, like, if you're seeing it for the first time, it won't make sense why it works, but I'll, I'll try to do this kind of multiple times. And I encourage you to read this in multiple places and it should make sense. So we basically end up doing another convolution, right? So we've acquired all these patterns, right? And these patterns are, you can interpret them as the amount of this specific pattern at every spatial part in the image. And there's 96 of them. So what we can actually do is we can kind of combine them into a new image, right? Uh, or I should say image in quotation marks. What I mean by that is that we're combining the image into like a, a, a something that's akin to an image. It's like a multiple channel volume of information but it has 96 channels instead of three. So when we say image, there's a connotation that an image has three channels, red, green, and blue, and maybe sometimes alpha, right? But this is an image which has 96 channels, and those channels do not correspond to the amount of col the color in that pixel. They amount to the amount of a particular pattern at that spatial location, right? This visual might kind of help explain this um, if I, we look at this yeah it's like we can not this oh yeah it's like we can imagine the these uh, uh, the, these data the, these uh, activation apps as being like a volume of information it's like um, you know an image is something that's like this it has a height and weight except it has a depth of three right and then the results of this is it's a volume of information which has a depth of 96 and a height and width of, of like 112 now. It happens to be 112. Um, yeah? So basically this is the 96 filters compared to the entirety of your image. And then the next thing you do is collapse that. Into you collapse that into a single volume of, uh, of like activations that comes out of that layer. And then what we do with that is that we do another round of convolution with a new set of filters on it. Now here's the thing, so, and, that, and this is the result of that. And in this case, there's like 200 filters. Now here's, this is the confusing thing. Uh, you might want to look at the filters, right? But you can't actually visualize them the way that we visualize them here because the filters have to have the same depth as the activation. So these new filters have a depth of 96. So we do this convolution across every single element in, the, in that volume. And then we get a single one of these. And then if we have, let's say, 200 of them, right? I think there's roughly 200. We'll get 200 activations. So this is, first of all, this is a huge amount of multiplications. Think about it, because if there's 96 channels coming out of this, then one filter has 96 channels, and it might be something like 5 by 5 by 5. So, or sorry, 5 by 5, let's say. I, I don't know what it actually is, but let's say it's 5 by 5. And there's 96 channels. So there's 2,400 weights in a single filter at that, right? And there happens to be like 200 of them, right? So there's like, um, so that means there's this many weights, you know, quite a few, uh, 480,000 weights. So first of all, just to, to, let's take a moment to appreciate the scale of this. Like when we introduced those neuron diagrams, we had, we had at the most complicated, we, we had initially three, right? Then we had a two by three by one neural network, which had 13 parameters. 
this has 480,000 parameters just in that one layer, right? Um, and, and it gets bigger, right? And it's, and it's way bigger than, for example, like when we had a fully connected network for MNIST, it was 784 times 10 plus 10 times 10. So it was like just 8,000, you know, something, something like that. So this is, this is a, huge, uh, a huge amount of weights now, yeah? So um, in previous, uh, I guess, examples of, of neural networks that I've seen, a lot of um, work is done to get some, you know, some downsample images, get them to a nice sort of like bite-sized chunks, and then process it. Um, and is that, uh, is there ever a point when um, it will be more beneficial to not do that, or is that actually just always going to be useful because in the future, even if you do have more computational power, Wait, when you say, like, you mean crop them to some standard size? Crop them to some standard size, but also uh, make sure that size is not a big size. Like, um, like, usually there's a down, like, like you'll down sample. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those questions that's maybe a bit beyond the scope of, a scope of this. It's like a detail, right? So, I mean, you know, you could see pros and cons to having a small versus large size. Like the more you downsample it before you input it into the network, the more information you're getting rid of. On the other hand, the, the uh, smaller of a neural network you'll need. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Like for whatever reason, uh, this, this network is set up to, for the images to be 225 by 225. Why that works? You know, because maybe that gets a nice balance between not getting rid of too much information, but also not, not overloading the network with too much information in the beginning, right? Because ultimately, it's going to get downsampled anyway. So the question is, like, do you want to do it with through convolutions, or do you want to do it like in the beginning, just by making it smaller? Yeah. Can Details. You talk, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the different uh, approaches to filtering? Why uh, choose these filters? You don't choose them. You f you train them. You they're learned through training, right? So we we haven't talked about how that's done, but we do not choose these filters. They're they're learned through the process of training. So initially they're random. We just set, we initialize them as random and then they are learned. And what is the actual um, process that you're doing to the image? The, the process that you're doing to learn the filters is, is in this case, it's generally gradient descent. Okay. And we'll learn that next week, yeah, to some degree. Like <laughs> um, so, okay, so we have these activations now at this layer and so the way to interpret this like you can kind of still see the outline of me in there right but the patterns are kind of more abstract now like you might say that the patterns are um it's going really slowly because i'm i'm both recording and i'm like really like stressing out my gpu right now so i might want to not do this for so long but basically like um it's uh these patterns okay in the first layer they might have been patterns like edges right these patterns might be slightly more complex. They're, com they're combinations of edges, right? They might be corners, they might be crosses, they might be parallel lines, perpendicular lines, so on. Like simple patterns, right? But, but, but ever so more slightly complex than the ones that we had in the first layer, right? And so what happens is we take those and we do another normalization, another pooling on it, and then we get yet another round of convolutions, and then another round of convolutions, and another round of convolutions, right? Now, now it's beginning to become more and more like hard to see this sort of spatialness of this, right? And, and, my, and it's actually reacting very slowly, but I'm still in there, right? But the things that it's detecting are, are becoming more difficult to interpret because they're patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns, right? They're multiple, uh, like a hierarchy of patterns of other patterns, right? And so what could they be, right? Well, um, a lot of them are hard to interpret, but some of them are actually like reasonably, um, they can be interpreted. So I'm going to scroll down actually, and I'm going to find you con4156. I happen to know this filter, this one right here. Let's check this out, right? It, it's okay, so it, it's, it's going really slowly right now. Um, but you can see, okay, the, the, it's re, it's update, it should be updating like more or less like once or twice per second, but because I'm recording my screen at the same time, it's like only doing a forward pass once every like three seconds right now. But you can see what's going on. It's, that's my face, right? It's, it's responding to my face. If I cover my face for like three seconds, 
it's gonna it should go away, right? <laughs> so um, if we put two faces in there, you know, I won't ask for a, a volunteer, but if there were two faces, it would see two faces. I can even put a face on the phone, and then it would find it, like roughly. Now, now the thing is, it doesn't say anywhere in the network this is a face, right? That's just my interpretation, right? This is a feature. It's a feature. It's a face feature. It seems to be looking for faces. Now, why would it learn faces, right? And you might even see some of them. Some of the other ones look like they might be responding to faces also. It's hard to say. Like maybe if I. Mm, this one doesn't seem to be quite invariant to faces. It's more like maybe it's detecting skin tone or something like that. But in any case, they're hard to interpret. But some of them seem to be responding to things that we can we can actually. Uh, identify and and in one of the later weeks like we're going to talk about visual visualization which is going to uh, approaches to visualization uh, sorry, approaches that use visualization to try to interpret what's actually being seen by these networks right how many people here are familiar with deep dream okay most of you right um, deep dream actually comes out of research which is fundamentally concerned with trying to figure out what each of these neurons are actually responding to because it's not easy for us to just look at them and say but it turns out that you can do experiments um, which synthesize images which which activate these neurons that's basically what deep dream is and we'll, we'll actually learn that later in the semester like a few probably a few weeks from now um, in any case like they're high level features and some of them are more abstract than others but but they're basically capturing that so what happens is finally at the end we'll take all of these and then they get flattened into uh, it, it, they get flattened into a single it's very flickery but they get flattened into a single row and then we do like um, a fully connected layer on top of that and then you get it's really glitchy right now I, you can see that it, it shouldn't be doing that it's just glitching out right now um, but but in any case like you get these activations a fully connected layer of activations. I've, I've put it into a rectangle, but really it's just like a big row, right? And then we will do another fully connected layer. That's just the architecture of this thing. And then we can actually then do classifications on top of it, uh, or we should do, there, there we go, yeah. So now it's trying to classify what it sees. Neck, brace, bow tie, wig. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> like, okay, let's do, it's really, really slow. This is generally not so slow. But, um, come on. Wow, it's like one every five seconds. iPod, finally. Not bad. Right. iPod. Okay. Stupid network. It's an iPhone. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, bottle of... It'll probably say bottle, wig. Yeah. Now, okay, why is it thinking I'm a, I have a wig? Well, well, there's, there's good reasons for that, but... Um, but basically, like, of course, yeah, well, I've done this joke too many times, I can't do it again. <laughs> anyway, um, let's, let's continue because this thing is going to cause my computer to glitch out. So, okay, it's doing classification, right? And um, the classification is pretty accurate. Like, it's giving us the top ranked results out of a thousand classes. Now, one, one interesting thing to consider is, okay, neck, neck brace, wig. Why, why would it, like, what, do I look like a neck brace, right? Do I look like a bow tie? Like why would it? Why would those come up high with a low confidence, nevertheless? But 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 coming up, um, why would it associate me with bow ties? Does anyone want to take a guess at that, Oren? Because um, images with bow ties often also have people on them. Yes, exactly. Um, so you can call this sample bias, right? So like images of parachutes have people on in them, and so a network that's trained to detect parachutes might actually like kind of associate parachutes with people, right? There's no, the network just gets a simple signal from us. These are images of blank, you know, wigs, right? And wigs often appear on top of either people's heads or on top of like mannequins or whatever. And so, um, or it may be just be that like, it's just trying to, you know, offend me. Like, uh, <laughs> but who knows? It could be either one. <laughs> so, um, okay, let's get out of this. And, uh, Let's get back to the slides. Okay, so that's the basic idea of convolutional networks, right? Uh, and and now just a little bit of historical uh, stuff. In 2012, a convolutional network named uh, nicknamed AlexNet, named after like the chair, the main author on the paper is Alex Krashevsky. 
um, along with Ilya Sutskiver and Jeffrey Hinton, who I mentioned, they came up with a convolutional neural network which was able to win the ImageNet competition. And the ImageNet competition was, a, is an annu- was an annual competition held since 2010. Basically, people trying to uh, get the highest accuracy on image classification for this standard data set called ImageNet. Right? So um, in 2010, when the, when the competition launched, the highest top five error rate was around 28%. What that means is that if you send these millions of images through the, this model, whatever, and, you, and it takes five guesses, right? And there's a thousand classes, right? So five guesses is not that many, right? If you take random guesses, you'll have, a, you'll have an accuracy, a top five accuracy of, of what would that be? 0.5%, right? So, um, so, it's, so having, which would, which would correspond to like a top five error of 99.5%, right? So the top systems in 2010 were usually these sort of ensemble computer vision systems that were not using neural networks, right? Because we had other techniques in computer vision for doing image classification, um, which were, were not deep learning based. And they had an accuracy where 30, something like 30% of the samples, you would not get it right in your top five guesses. That's pretty good, right? Like if you think about it, a thousand classes getting 72% uh, top five accuracy is like quite an achievement. However, it's certainly not good enough to do anything practical with, like have it inside of, have it inside of a tech service, right? Or on the website that's doing image classification, just not good enough, right? And so we were kind of making in- incremental progress and then something major happened in 2012, which was that the first deep learning approach was submitted, this AlexNet, and it completely blew everything out of the competition. It was, a, it was like a 10% reduction in a top five error. And in 2012, that's when everything kind of snapped. That was like the year that deep learning, which had been kind of like a very, very small minority of people within machine learning, became suddenly like the thing to do because then in 2013 all of the submitted systems were deep learning systems and it went down from a top uh top top five error of 16 percent to something like 12 percent in 2014 down to six percent i mean this is like huge like you know uh making huge progress basically at now in 2017 it stands at 2.25 percent right so in the period of seven years we went from a top five error of left something like 27 or 28 percent to 2.25 percent, and um, this is kind of a joke. This whole human thing. Um, there's a there's a really nice blog post by Andre Karpathy, who's who was in um, in like 2016 was a graduate student at Stanford and is now the head of AI at Tesla. So like uh, again, anyone in deep learning like in in uh, in a few since a few years ago is like now. You know, like what, because deep learning just completely revolutionized the field, basically. Um, So, but he, anyway, he wrote a really funny blog post where he tried to compete against the neural network in in doing classification in ImageNet. And, you know, it's actually hard for a human. Like, there's a thousand categories, and like 200 of them are dogs, dog breeds. And it's like, who knows the difference between, like, you know, these dog breeds and stuff. So, it's actually really hard to beat these things. These networks are really good at at identifying different dog breeds and stuff. Um, any, in any case, like uh, the this competition was actually retired this year. Um, this is the first year not holding it, and I think part of it is because like we've kind of gone as far as we can with ImageNet, and so now there's kind of like now people are expanding to different kinds of tasks. Um, but in any case, like image classification was com- has been like like largely solved almost like at least as a as a basic task, and it is the core task that that a lot of other tasks kind of emanate from. And we're gonna actually study those in more detail, I think, next week. But uh, but basically, that's that's the that has been the the sort of the narrative that has inspired all of this. It was really 2012 was a big year, and and actually, like one, um, I have some other graphs I think that are missing. But the like I showed yesterday, there was a I showed a graph that shows the rate of like venture capital uh, going into machine learning, and guess guess when it starts to spike, right? 2012. So that was like kind of this year where deep learning spilled over and it's just been increasing since then. Um, so yeah. So in any case, that's all the slides. Now, okay, let's see here. So it's 225. What I want to do now is uh, switch gears and like show you a few things that you can do with neural networks in the browser. 
And uh, I just want to mention like how I'm going to do this. Uh, I had everyone download these, but I, but um, in in the for the sake of trying to keep the lecture as concise as possible, I'm not going to like wait for everyone to like go through each step. I'm just going to show these as demonstrations, and because I'm also recording it, you'll be able to look at this later. So feel free to to do this along with me if you'd like, uh, but you certainly don't have to um, because again, you'll be able to do this in your own time, slower later. Um, and, and for the most part, I'm just going to be doing demonstrations. I'm not going to really necessarily um, say too much yet about the, about the actual code. I'll, I'll show you the code and the implementation and just show you a few basic things that you need to know about it. And for everything else, like um, we'll, we're, we're going to kind of rely on some of the offline materials. Um, so uh, basically, the, the thing that I had you download was these ML4A de demos. And all of those, uh, I think, all, uh, maybe not all of them, most of them are built on top of ML5, which is this JavaScript library. We introduced it yesterday. So it's a JavaScript library that is basically trying to wrap TensorFlow.js uh, into an easy to use way. So you might say it's kind of like a machine learning JavaScript library in the spirit of, let's say, something like P5.js, which is trying to make it uh, nice and easy to use for people in creative fields and art and design and so on. Um, that's the basic idea. right? Um, and I'm just going to show you a few of the examples from there. We're not going to show all of them because some of them are going to be more relevant to next week. Um, nevertheless, I think that's going to be kind of like the best use of our time. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to get out of the slides. Um, and, oop, and, and what I've done is, so if you want to, if you want to follow these along, right, so you, you'll have to... What you would actually, what you would do is basically open the terminal, and I'm just going to actually do this from scratch. So just so you can see what I'm doing. In order to run these, you would go to wherever your ML for a demo uh, folder is. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are not super comfortable with terminal, I'm planning on recording like a supplementary lecture on just kind of what to do, what I'm, how to do what I'm doing right now, which is operating a terminal. I know it seems like most people have actually had some exposure to this. Like I, I think when, when I asked yesterday, it seems like a, uh, maybe some of your other classes have, have done some basic terminal stuff. But for those who are not super comfortable with the terminal, I'm going to release like a supplementary lecture, I, I think hopefully this week. Um, in any case, we're not going to need to do too much with it right now. The only thing that we're going to do is basically from the root folder, of um, ML for a demos, which is here. Basically, you'll need to just launch a local server from the root folder. And the reason why um, uh, the reason why we uh, do this is because you can't just open the the HTML pages because um, like cross scripting errors and so on. Right? Someone probably knows this better than me. But we need to run a local local server. And the easiest way to do this, there's kind of two nice ways of doing this. One is just doing using using the Python's built-in local server, um, which might work slightly different in everyone's computers. We'll, we'll go over that in a second. Another really easy way of doing this is to use something like Brackets. Brackets is um, an application that is, it's basically like a text editor, um, but it also kind of runs a local server that you can kind of, that you, you can use. In your, I'm going to do it the simple way with, with the local server. But for anyone who is interested in, in kind of like putting this into an IDE, um, they may want to look into using something like brackets. So basically what, we'll, what I'm going to do is from the root folder, I'm going to run the following command. If you're using Python 2, you would do Python dash M H simple HTTP server. Now, uh, I think I know some of the new Macs don't come with Python installed. So tell me if anyone does anyone who's actually trying to go along with it, does it say something like Python not found? Um, because if so, then you'll have to install Python. But I think I think that should work for everyone. You oh, Another thing that, uh, is that for some of the newer computers, it might only have Python 3, in which case the syntax is slightly different. Chris, you might know this, right? It's like there's a... Yeah. Um, what is that? It's like you could also do it like Python... Dash M, and it's like... Dot. No, no. Oh. Ah, yeah. And then yeah. So if the first one didn't work, try doing this instead because it's just a Python Python three thing. 
Um, in any case, for me, it works this way. So what it'll do is it'll open up, it says serving HTTP on, on 00, that means localhost, port 8000. So what you would do is you would basically just go to like localhost 8000, right? And you'll get this page and it's the index page that just shows a bunch of these, a bunch of these um, uh, demos. Um, oh, and actually, um, you know what? Before I show these, I want to quickly show you some one from ML5 directly, which does the basic image classification thing. So if you were to go to, you don't have to do this right now. Like it'll work the same for everybody, but it might it might be fun, might might be a fun thing, if we don't if we can all kind of get along with the internet. If you go to ml5js.org, and then you click on um, examples. We can try doing the video classification. So this is kind of this is basically the thing that I just showed you, except on the in the browser, which is really cool. So it'll ask for your permission to use your camera, and this I'm guessing this is going to work really slowly for me because again I'm recording my screen on a really old laptop, and it's it's a miracle that it's working at all. But uh, what it'll do is okay, it'll download the model and it'll go okay, it'll start labeling it. Yeah, I don't think it's quite as accurate as the as the one in Open Frameworks because this mobile net is a very small model. It's the it, it, what it what it's doing is actually you're downloading a neural network, you're downloading a model that's being served to you by ML5JS website, and then the model is being run locally. So there's no server that is trying to that that you're sending the image to. Everything, all the computation is being done in the browser, um, which is really neat. Uh, now the model, because it's the because it's on the web, there's a of course like having a 500 megabyte model uh, is not exactly ideal, right? So the model that I use in Open Frameworks is something like 500 megabytes, um, or, or maybe it's 200. I can't remember. But the point is, it's something that you wouldn't want to have to download every time you go to a website. So MobileNet is a neural network which is severely compressed, um, and it actually like has almost the same performance. Uh, oh, sorry, almost the same accuracy, but uh, but it's much lighter and much faster, right? So you can see, okay, jersey t-shirt, I put my phone in front of it, iPod, cellular telephone, not so bad, right? Maybe a remote control, remote, bottle. You can try different things. Um, let me try this. Let's see what this is. Band-Aid, eggnog. That's kind of neat. Sometimes it sometimes it does the really fun, funky thing. Let's try this. Does anyone have any object that like we can try to put into the recording that, that might be kind of funny? Like, what's something? What if we just? What if I go away? Screen. Yeah, it's good enough. Um, markers maybe. You're gonna draw something. Huh? Oh, that's a good idea. Um, well, what should we draw? A cat. A cat. I need something darker. These are not permanent, right? I'm not gonna. This <laughs> is not gonna. I need to draw it much bigger. All right, this is this is an experiment for an, a, another time. Like a laptop. Well, now it's a laptop. That's kind of interesting. Um, well, in any case, like yeah. Well, anyhow. A lot of fun times can be had with image classification, right? In any case, like let's let's get out of this. I'm going to show you some of these other things. Um, now, uh, let me just get out of this. It's going to freak out. Um, oh, and actually, okay, before before I show you these demos, I need to do one more explanation of something. Let me go back to the slides. And the thing is that the demos that I'm going to show you are based on a technique called transfer learning. So let me let me describe what's going on in transfer learning. So, um, it, it, okay, like I, we, I downloaded, we, we've done two things so far. We downloaded a network on, called MobileNet, which is doing image classification on, on you know, how many samples, like, uh, or how many categories, 1,000, right? And it has things like wig, you know, remote control, whatever, right? Now that's kind of neat, you know, it usually impresses people, but but at some point you're thinking, okay, well, I can't really build something off of this because maybe I'm not concerned with these 1,000 objects, right? Maybe you want to build your own classifier, which responds to whatever categories you happen to pick, right? Now, uh, there's two ways of, of building your own classifier. 
One would be to collect several tens or hundreds of thousands of images of the categories that you wish to recognize uh, and train a neural network from scratch to do that. Um, now, that's kind of suboptimal, right? Because tens of thousands of images, it's not like you can just easily acquire tens of thousands of images of the things that you're interested in, right? So instead, we're going to use a brilliant technique called transfer learning, which lets us train very accurate image classifiers on much, much, much less data than uh, hundreds of thousands of samples. And the trick is to use an existing neural network, which has already been trained on some other data set, and to kind of reconfigure it or, or, or re refine it, let's say, adapt it to a new task. Right? And this is, this, is, uh, this is called transfer learning. Um, and, and basically, like, and the, the takeaway, or let, let's say the, the main principle is that, um, or, or the thing that I wish to convey about this technique is that when we're dealing with neural networks, there's a tendency for people to think of them as black boxes that give you, you know, some image classification or regression, right? But really, the thing, the really good stuff, right, is inside, is inside the network itself. Because in order to do image classification, uh, like let's say on the very large data set, we have to form a very good representational model of the of images, right? And that representational model actually has a lot of power in it that can be adapted to other scenarios, right? So the good stuff is in here, and actually the good stuff is really right there, like right at the end, right? Because recall from our demo that as we go through the layers of the network, it forms a higher and higher level um, like representation of the original image. It can detect things like faces, right? Faces or, you know, whatever patterns that we were able to identify, right? Now, in the last layer before the classification, we have this sort of high level representation of the image. And then that layer plugs into a classification layer. That last layer, maybe we don't care about it. We don't care about what the classifications are. We want to use our own. So what we can do is we can actually take an existing neural network and fetch the last, the last layer of activations from it and use that as a sort of uh, representation of, of a new image that we want to train. And it's much better than the representation of using the raw image, right? Because it has these high level features. And you know, maybe you might be thinking like it has, it doesn't have the high level features that I want, right? But actually, like it turns out that uh, image classification done on many, many different kinds of data sets often converges on similar features anyway. So like if you're almost, you know, faces are very generic, right? Like with these 1000 categories in ImageNet, faces are useful for finding things like wigs and, you know, wigs and, and, and I don't know what else, bow ties and things like that, right? But like if you're trying to detect people, right, probably faces are going to be useful to you anyway, right? And so we can actually use this neural network to feed a smaller neural network um, and, and train it. And by doing so, it can actually train it like on many, many like orders of magnitude fewer samples. And that's very, very powerful. So like a, a better way of looking at it is like this. Let's say we take a trained neural network, which is very large. Let's say, imagine this is very, very large and it's already trained and we use it as the, uh, we use its output as the input to a new smaller neural network that we use to adapt to that we want to train for a new image classification task that uh, happens to have the categories that we that we want, right? Um, and that, that's that's basically the the idea of transfer learning: big neural network feeding a smaller neural network. There's other ways of doing this, like 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 um, maybe you don't free, you don't, maybe you can actually change these weights slightly also. That's called fine tuning. But generally speaking, in, for, for our case, for, for our scenarios, we're going to use a big neural network to feed the input of a small neural network. And, and actually, but we're, we're not going to use the output, the classifications. We're actually going to go one layer before that. We're going to extract those feature vectors in the second to last layer of the network and, feed, and use those as the input to a small neural network. Now, why use that instead of the classification layer? because the classification layer is just a little bit too specific, right? 
we like the layer before that, or maybe even in some cases the layer even before that, because those features are slightly more generic and maybe more relevant to a, a new set of image categories. Um, did someone have a question here? Uh, okay, yeah. So when you say the input, that means it's retraining a new model be, be, yeah, exactly. Like using those features, like the the best way to visualize it is kind of like this. Like we take a neural network that is trained on many millions of images. Let's say it's very robust, and we just we use it. We hold it fixed, and we we extract features from an image. I think the next visual is a little better, right? We can take this neural network, right, and then take a new image, and we can use it as a fixed feature extractor, which means like we take whatever the activations are in the second to last layer and we use that as as our in as, as our like input oh sorry sorry as the input to the to a smaller neural network and the reason this works better is because now like we have this high level representation and it's going to it's like uh, like neural networks always require more samples if you're dealing with very low level data if you're dealing with very high level data it can it can actually learn to recognize those categories much faster, much faster. Um, so that this that's the basic idea of transfer learning. Uh, so yeah, the basically the demos I'm going to show you are along these lines. Um, I'll show you the demos first, and then I'll come back to these slides, and I'll show you a few projects that other people have made. I have a little showcase of projects that are using the transfer learning technique. So that's gonna so let me show you the demos first, and then we'll go to that. Um, basically, if you were to go to the, like, we'll start with a simple classification, right? You would click into that. It's going to ask to use the camera, right? And this is, this is, it's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, this is, let's make this a little smaller. So basically what, what happens here, this is a really simple app. It, it's going to, it's loaded mobile net and we're going to use mobile net to extract features from the image and to feed a new neural network, which has three categories, and we're going to custom train them, right? And, and here, it's just, it just happens to be coded to use uh, three classes, but you could, you could do, any, in theory, any amount of categories, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my phone in front of the camera, and I'm going to click class zero. And, and initially, it might take a little while to respond in the first one, because it kind of has to initialize the network. And in particular, it might, it might be really slow for mine. Yeah, there we go, one. So you now I see is one. There, that means we have one sample. So if I click it again, it'll say two. Okay. So let me click this a whole bunch of times. And it's going to go really slowly because my computer is like, like grinding to a halt right now. But OK, tw let's just do 20 something, right? So 20 something images of my phone. Now let me do. 20 something images of this remote and I'm going to click class one. So I'm going to click class one a whole bunch of times. Okay, and we're going to get something like 20 samples. It's very slow, very sluggish. Okay, and now the last one I'll do is going to be just me. So like not holding anything at all. Me and this little kitty cat. Okay, we'll get up to something like 20, and then basically I'm gonna hit the train button when it has our final samples. I'm gonna hit, oh man, it's really slow. So there we go, 34. Now I'm gonna hit train. This is also gonna take a while. Normally, like if you didn't have your, com your GPU being occupied by a process like recording your whole screen pixels on an old computer, it should actually go really fast. Like it'll, like uh, for those of you who are trying it, it'll probably take you like just a second basically to train. There we go. Now it's training. It's probably going to take like a minute or something like that to train. Um, there we go. Down goes to loss of zero. And at some point, once it's done, I can hit click guess and it will begin to guess, right? So basically I'll put my phone in front of the camera and I'll go guess. <laughs> Zero, right? Zero was the phone, right? If I put the remote in front of it and I click guess, one, two, 
one, right? So it's going, so it's, so on just something like 20 to 30 samples, it's able to detect the image pretty effectively. And it's doing it in the browser. So you could take this, this app and you could put it online. That's what ml5js.org is, right? It's just the, it's basically these samples online. And uh, it's doing really effective image classification, right? Now, uh, a more slightly more sophisticated example, which I'm, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but if you were to click on guitar, it's the same exact thing, except it attaches an action to, uh, to, to the, each of the categories. I don't wanna train it because it'll take too long, but, but if you actually go through this, once it starts guessing, it'll start guessing continuously, and every time it detects class zero, it'll pluck the E string. And every time it, it detects class one, it'll pluck the A string. Uh, or, or I don't remember exactly which notes, but it goes through a pentatonic scale. So like really simple, right? And the code for it is actually incredibly simple. Like, I mean, I shouldn't say it's incredibly simple, but it's not much more complicated than a standard P5JS type script, right? And we can actually look at it right now. I'm gonna show it to you really briefly. So if you go to the examples, you'll see, so for those of you who have done P5JS stuff, and I assume that's basically everybody, right? Uh, it then, uh, it, this code should be quite recognizable. It, the only difference is that it's also including ML5. And I guess a few of you have, wor have worked with ML5 already, right? I, I suppose. Um, but if you were to look at this, it's, it's, uh, there's only a few minor additions that we have to kind of specify. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you them really quickly. Um, I'm going to also get out of this so that it goes a little faster. Right, so basically, here's the sketch. It's a standard P5JS sketch. And then basically loading all of these uh, MP3s for e uh, like the guitar, plucking the guitar. And then the only, the only thing that's really happening is that basically um, whenever, it, uh, whenever you hit the classify button, or, or sorry, guess button, you get this, it, it basically calls got results. And then it gives you a label and then that's that's it. Like here, it's just using the DOM library to write what label it is. And then I'm saying, okay, if the label is not whatever the last label was, play, play that label, or play that sample associated with that label. So really, really like relatively simple P5JS script, right? So it's very easily adaptable. So if you're already doing stuff in P5JS, you can imagine kind of uh, integrating this process to add a little bit of machine learning into it, right? That it responds to some sort of uh, like camera stimulus, right? Uh, I wanna quickly show you now um, the, like a, just a couple examples of this that are like maybe, maybe slightly uh, more interesting, right? Now these are, these are really bare bones, right? So like the, the guitar example. Uh, but one thing is I got this Pong code from I think somebody here. Who wrote the initial Pong? Is that, is it you? Okay, yeah, yeah. I basically, I, so actually Andreas took this and I just stole it from him. So we stole it two generations down from you. I think it's on the open processing, right? It's on, on there. Oh, is it? Okay, where'd it come from? Anyway, like, uh, let's, let's actually do this, right? So basically, I'm associating the slider with, like, the position of the paddle, right? So... I'm gonna add a bunch of samples of like me over, let, let's do me over here, right? And I'm gonna add a whole bunch of samples. It's extremely slow. Like this will be a little better for you. Um, this game is also incredibly hard too. I've made it like, <laughs> this is possibly too slow to do effectively. So I may, I may just skip it. Basically, all right, let me just describe what happens in case my computer can't handle it right now. I'm associating, this is regression. So I associated a bunch of pictures of me over here with the slider on the left. Now I'm gonna put the slider on the right and take a bunch more samples, right? Okay, that'll take a whole bunch of samples, 54. Now I'm gonna hit train. Very, very slow. Um, I'll describe what it's doing. What, this is, now we're training a regression instead of a classification. So now I'm basically going to attempt to play Pong by moving my head around, right? Um, so I guess I have to go, yeah, down here. Oh man, is it ever so slow. Yeah. So 
I could use a new computer. I bet I'm still not going to be able to go. Oh, no, no, too far. Too far. <laughs> it's really hard. And actually, the AI is unbeatable. It's like an AI just goes down if the ball, you know, AI. It goes down if the ball is too low. It's unbeatable. It's like a wall. We can, we can cheat maybe by making, making, like, making it slower, but, but, oh, okay, I lost. Anyway, like, okay, you can make games, right? So that's, that's the basic idea I was trying to get across. Another, um, I'm not going to show it right now, but you can go through the regression and generative art example. It just has like a simple sort of like Perlin noise to make some interesting generative art. And then I have one parameter that's being controlled by a slider, right? Um, so that's really neat. I'm going to show the PoseNet examples um, and, and like the, and the pitch detection ones later at a later class, or feel free to look at them in your own time. They're, they're pretty straightforward. I haven't introduced PoseNet yet, so like that's something we'll talk about maybe uh, either next week or the week after. Uh, but basically, feel free to like go through these and try to adapt them. Right? These are these are P5 scripts. So for those of you who are already pretty comfortable with that, um, try to think of how you might be able to integrate a smart camera sensor to kind of like uh, to kind of modulate it. Right? Um, so let me show you like a few cool examples. Of things that people have made with this technique. Now, I'm not I'm not showing you ML uh, I'm not showing you ML5 projects per se. These are just like transfer learning examples. So these are just like, like things that you can do in a cool like you know very uh, a lot of these are ITP projects actually. So these these will be very much like um, relevant to you. Um, let me let me actually just show you. Oh, actually, this is not an ITP project, but I really like this one. So this was posted like two years ago and by someone on Reddit. It's called Can I Hug That. So basically, he uh, or I don't know who, who was he or she trained a, a transfer learn model to basically classify uh, or to, to predict how huggable something is. So they basically fed like a bunch of images of like teddy bears and, and I think like croissants and like beach balls and things like things that you could hug, right? And then and then they threw in like images of things that you wouldn't hug, like a bandsaw and like a porcupine and, you know, things, things like that. And, um, and then uh, trained it to predict how huggable something is. So, okay, so this, like, this thing is very huggable with a confidence of 70%. This thing is very not huggable with a confidence of 99%. So don't hug the bandsaw, right? Um, this was made by actually... Um, uh, one of my so the last time I taught here was two years ago. This is a student of mine in my in my class named Chino Kim. So he's a former ITP student. I don't suppose anyone here knows him. I guess he graduated before before uh, anyone was here. What was that? Oh, is that right? Okay, so some of you know him. Anyway, um, he did this really neat thing where he has these beta blockers. These are glasses that can be made to fog up, and so he trained it to detect screens like computer screens. Anytime that that camera sees that he's looking at a screen, like a camera or uh, sorry, like a computer screen or a t or a smartphone, the the glasses fog up, right? So don't wear them while you're driving. Um, so, um, and and actually, this the, the, when he made this, this got into motherboard. Uh, I think it got covered by motherboard. Um, the next thing, uh, also made by uh, people that you may know, these are um, so. Uh, Corbin was a student of mine, and Aaron helped him on this. I think Aaron is a uh, resident now, or, or was last year, right? Okay, he's not no longer. Okay, this is this is really this is really funny. So basically, it's a piano that has had its back taken out, and there's like a robotic arm, uh, like on the strings, and they trained it to watch the movie Die Hard, and then whenever it detects explosions, so it's constantly classifying the screen, the image, and whenever there's explosions, and Die Hard has a lot of explosions, um, the piano begins to play itself rigorously. So, piano Die Hard. Um, uh, another former ICB student, Seth Kranzler, who's also probably a resident here, I think, maybe, um, he, he built this thing called Neural Recycle. Um, and what this is doing is um, it's trained to identify things that can be recycled and things that can't be recycled. So this would tell you like, okay, it's a bottle, it's a glass, this can be recycled, and then you can throw it into the recycling bin. And otherwise, uh, you can throw it into the trash. As a joke, he made it uh, classify iPhones as trash. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, so that was a really neat project. And these are all examples of transfer learning, right? It's just like training a simple image classifier on the camera to detect two or more different categories of objects and then attaching it to some sort of interaction, right? So this is a very, very, um, it's a very generic, but nevertheless extremely like adaptable uh, like template for interactive projects, right? And so I can imagine like like uh, this can be very very like you can I'm sure people already have ideas just thinking of it, right? Um, and then I showed this yesterday, but um, this was um, a project by Bjorn Carmen at CIID, and basically, and we're trying to make this work on the Raspberry Pi right now. It looks like it's working inside the device, but it actually is. Uh, sending the image to an off-screen computer, but it should be able to work on the Raspberry Pi now. And what it does is a simple image classifier attached uh, that turns an appliance on or off. Um, and and so, okay, so like, what can you do with that? You can turn, you can turn a light on or off, right? You can turn a reading desk, reading lamp on or off, or or um, like the other example that I that I uh, that he had in this video was like. Um, person is in front of a, uh, t- a table electric saw and whenever it sees that that the operator does not have safety goggles on it turns off right so you can imagine um, uh, and actually this is just that's just a binary but of course like it can be trained on multiple classes and we have this ml for pi library that you can find in the M for uh, how many people here are doing raspberry pi stuff Okay, a handful of people. For those of you who are interested, uh, we just put the script online and it should more or less work, but uh, it might take a little bit of, like I'd, I'd definitely be happy to work with somebody on this because we want to develop it. So for anyone who's interested in making like small devices that do this kind of stuff, um, you, can, you, can, uh, you can use this ML for Pi library and um, it'll, it should implement this thing. Um, then, let's see here. The ne- I think I have one or two more. Oh, okay, so then, Okay, so we're basically done. Uh, I want to basically tell you what's what's in store for next week, and um, so next week we're going to do a lecture that describes a little bit more detail how neural networks are trained. I, I we'll see like how much attention we want to devote to it because, like I said, like a lot of the stuff that you're going to do with this class you can do by assuming that the training process is a black box, but because we have a nice twelve week long class and I and I want people to appreciate the beauty of these things. Uh, I do want to. I'm going to do a lecture on how uh, neural networks are trained, which you know I, I'll I'll try to keep it as short as I can, uh, and it'll and it'll describe you know like this thing that we have figured out how to do after after many many years like effectively, and then I'm going to show you some more um, applications. Uh, in uh, principle, I'm going to show you the ones from ML for OFX, uh, and and possibly some Wakinator stuff. Uh, so like one of the apps that I'll show you is this one, Doodle Classifier, which, which will run on anybody's computer. So you can just download it. In fact, you can download it now if you want. Like no reason that you can't, that you can't start this week. Um, you can download it right now and train it to recognize different categories of images. Oh, sorry, different categories of drawings. And actually like other people, uh, some people have used this like uh, not even on, on, drawings of, on drawings, but you can do it with objects on top of a platform. Like the whole point is that it segments the image into multiple things and it finds them. Um, I use this on a project that I'll show you next week called Doodle Tunes. You know, so like you can imagine like uh, it'll try to just get the ideas flowing um, towards like some sort of things that we can that we can try to work with. Um, okay, so here's what I want to ask to do, and this is this is actually a very this assignment is very like uh, not very specific. So I, because like I said, like we haven't haven't figured out exactly how I want to treat assignments. So this is a soft assignment. Basically, um, the reading is I would say is kind of optional. Like maybe if you, like if you feel like you want to understand this 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 better, please go to ml 4 agithubio um, which which is here, right? And it's actually like you can just click ML for A from the syllabus, and then try to read these. Oh, it says one plus two plus three, but basically these four chapters are roughly done, or these these four chapters are done. It's it's a fair bit of reading, so it's a it's a lot of reading. So I you know, I I would say that like for those who are more interested in practical stuff, like you can feel free to like not necessarily like read all of it. But for those who are interested, like I hope this might make it make some of what we looked at today make a lot more sense right um and then uh and then the other thing is like uh i'd like for you to uh download ml for a demos 
and try to adapt one of the examples in it and do something cool, like do something creative. Um, and it would be very, very simple modification. Um, and I haven't decided whether I want you to turn, turn those in. Maybe like, oh, actually, okay, then the other assignment from, week, from yesterday is come see me. Um, so I want to meet everybody at some point. This like in the next maybe okay maybe twenty people will be hard to to like meet everybody in the next week. But like um, come come to me yeah like and show me what you're working on like that would be the, the ideal. As I get to know you guys like I can tune the class to kind of what what people are what people are interested in right. So people might be interested in their interactive stuff and then later in the year or later in the semester we'll talk about the generative stuff and we'll see kind of wh which fits um, different people more. Question? Yeah. Uh, Ah, yes. Okay. So good, good question. Right. Um, so I'm a resident here, so I'm actually going to be here on a daily basis. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to leave a little bit early because I'm, I'm moving to a new place. Um, so like that kind of stuff. But generally I'll be here every day. And what I want to do is maybe um, I haven't set a specific office hours yet, but I think it would make sense to have my office hours on, on, Wednesday, on generally speaking on Wednesdays because the class is on Tuesdays. I think most people are here on Wednesdays, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a specific block of time that'll be my office hours. However, I'm uh, I, like feel free to like also just email me because I'll just be working downstairs generally uh, on the days that I'm not teaching. And so like if you if you if the office hours don't drive with your schedule, like it's it's completely fine to just do things on a come come by come basis. I, I might use an app called uh, I was looking at Calendly. Has anyone used this Calendly? Are you familiar? Okay, maybe I have to learn how to do it. I, I, as you can see, I'm very disorganized. So, so this kind of stuff. But like maybe that'll work better. Um, but uh, at some, let me. I will email you guys this week um, and figure out something about office hours. But let's say for this week, like while while I don't have my stuff sorted, like just like I'll be walking around. Like, come find me. Um, and uh, and that's all. So next week, uh, next week normal time. Like from now on, we'll be at the normal time. And, and actually, I guess um, the schedule is also, you can see here. So the, this, is, this is all the, it's now normal time. We're going to be off the first two weeks of October. Um, otherwise, it's a normal Tuesday schedule. And there's one week in November, which will also be off. So this is a 12-week 12, uh, 12 class. Um, OK, so that's all. Any, any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, I will post the lecture here. Uh, the first one's already online. I just got to add the link. I'm going to render this one and put it online, like, hopefully within the day. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, see you guys, in, like, this week.